Good morning. Thank you all for being here. You are here for the Transforming the Crisis Care Experience in California webinar with Kathy Maddenwall. I am Danielle and I'm from the um, Medi-Cal Mobile Crisis Training and Technical Assistance Center. I'm going to hand it over to um, my colleague Miranda March so she can do a quick introduction of our um, program. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Miranda March, and it is my pleasure to be the project director for the California Medi-Cal Mobile Crisis Response Training and Technical Assistance Center, um, called MTAC for short. Um, CARS is a California-based nonprofit, and we are thrilled to be working with DHCS to provide these services through the MTAC TA Center. Um, some of you we saw in our initial um, meet and greet session. So to those of you who saw us before, welcome back. Um, to those of you who are new to the project, um, we're very excited to um, have this opportunity to meet you. We've got a great presentation lined up for you today with some really um, innovative, expert, exciting thinkers who know a lot about mobile crisis and how to, um, how to create um, and sustain uh, mobile crisis services that are equitable and responsive and effective. So I'm really grateful to all of our speakers and all of our panelists. Again, I'm Randa March. My uh, colleague, Danielle Ruggi, will be um, doing the facilitation of the panel. She is um, a, a former uh, mobile crisis responder team lead herself, so she knows a lot of stuff that's going to be, I hope, really useful. And today's presentation is going to be delivered by Cappy Maidenwald, who is working with DHCS to um, help them roll out services under this new benefit. It. Um, we've had the opportunity to work with Cappy quite a bit. She is um, an absolute expert, maybe the expert in the state about uh, all things mobile crisis response related. Um, she's worked with a number of different states um, supporting their rollouts of mobile crisis response services. And we are so, so happy to have her with us today. And with that, I will turn it back to, um, to Cappy. Welcome and thank you. Thank you for thank that you. introduction. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I will just uh, note uh, that I do not actually live in California. I'm just doing this work in California. So in that sense, I don't have all of the local knowledge that you have and the state level knowledge that you have, but I have had a chance to work in uh, at least 20 states in the US. I did some a little bit of work in Canada and I've worked with dozens and dozens of communities and counties and um, some insurance companies as they figure out how to implement this kind of um, crisis service or sort of anything related to uh, crisis systems of care in their states or in their uh, regions. Um, crisis systems of care in general are undergoing change across the country. There is tremendous national interest in this. Uh, this is exciting. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I started this work, SAMHSA was not really talking about crisis work at all. Uh, Medicaid was not really talking about crisis work at all. And now there's just quite a bit of attention. And for a, a whole lot of reasons, um, there are more opportunities for uh, states and counties to implement these kind of services. Throughout my um, probably 18 years of consulting, 15 of that full time, um, I've had a chance to really watch how different crisis systems work. And with that, have, have been able to kind of get a sense of, you know, what are the competencies and attributes that are present in the most effective systems? Okay. Uh, so my hope today is that this conversation, this seminar, and the panelist conversation afterwards, and, and all of the questions that follow, I hope there's just a chance to stimulate creative thinking as you are on the front end uh, of this crisis system, either redesigned for some of you who already have, you know, probably had had years of um, some type of, of crisis system of care. Um, and then for others, they'll really be kind of implementing this type of service for the new time, uh, for the first time. Uh, so I hope it just furthers the collective vision. I, I hope it really stimulates some creative thought um, as you consider how to make this 
service most effective within your own community. And it is important to consider the needs and assets of your local communities. Of course, this is a very diverse state, geographically, culturally, uh, you know, population wise, um, resources and assets wise. And so it, it is important to consider those elements. Um, and to also very carefully look at the current habits of practice in the communities. One of the things that is so unique about um, crisis work is that the experience you get as the person in crisis varies tremendously based on what state you happen to be in when you're in crisis, what county you happen to be in within that state when you're in crisis, and those teams and how those teams are sort of configured. And the, the um, experience can range from a county that responds by very quickly calling 911 and sending police to places where police are very rarely involved at all and the care is in the community. And there are lots of alternatives in lieu of something like inpatient hospitalization. So it's vastly different. The composition of teams varies tremendously depending on where you are in the country. So there's really an opportunity to sort of rethink existing practices, rethink existing sort of team constellation, um, really look beyond the your own team to the broader habits of practice within the community. Um, and then within that, there's a lot of opportunities for innovation. And when I say broader habits of practice in the community, what I mean is all the decisions and actions that happen before your team ever gets the call to, to provide a mobile response. All of those things really influence um, the care experience. Some of what I talk about today might feel provocative. Um, it may even unearth some deeply held beliefs. And by deeply held belief, I mean those things that are, you know, often sort of subconsciously held um, that influence the way we practice. Um, they're, they're, they're so deeply held, they may feel like the only explanation. Uh, they may be something we deeply believe is true. Uh, and so some of those deeply held beliefs might come up today. And when that happens, candor is useful in sorting it out. Um, candor with yourself, candor with your colleagues, you can throw a comment into chat if something strikes you in that area. Um, sometimes the deeply held beliefs end up being related to sort of habits, stories, uh, things that end up inhibiting, inhibiting our ability to be as effective as we wanna be in this kind of work. Because things are provocative, because this can unearth some, unearth some deeply held beliefs, um, it's important that in any kind of training or coaching or learning collaborative, that there be a sense of psychological safety in the works in the in that meeting space. Psychological safety is a key ingredient in innovation. And it's really essential for innovation to sort of flourish. It makes it comfortable for us to explore areas where we are not doing as well, when care experience is not measuring up to our, to our vision. It allows us to take informed risks, to propose new approaches, to consider radical innovations that disrupt the status quo, but then lead to uh, greater success. This is, of course, parallel process to our work with individuals and families in crisis. So it's a really important element uh, to keep in mind here. We want psychological safety as we redesign the system. We want teams to feel psychologically safe when they go do this work in the field. And we want individuals to feel that are in crisis to feel psychologically safe as we work with them. And why is this so important? And, you know, chance to wake up and get your chat fingers kind of moving here. What is it that happens to us when we feel psychologically unsafe. And let's just kind of, for, for purposes of, of uh, sort of doing a little uh, exercise about this, imagine working in a workplace where you felt psychologically unsafe. What happens in that workplace? What changes for you 
when you feel psychologically unsafe in a workplace. What happens mentally? What happens performance-wise? I feel less creative. The nerves kick in. And when the nerves kick in, what happens? I feel uncertain. People shut down. My performance decreases. I don't want to go to work. There's resentment. A decrease in productivity. Fight or flight is activated. Uh, depression. I feel anxious. What happens to performance? I feel irritable. Um, what happens to creativity? I check out from the world. Uh, I get easily angered with others. And when we're in that psychologically unsafe space, what part of our brain has gotten triggered and activated? Yeah, the amygdala, right? We are having, and somebody talked about sort of a fight flight reaction, the reptilian, yes. We have, uh, you know, our, our, our brain has triggered the danger from this kind of psychologically unsafe, unsafe space that we're in. Uh, and we are on high alert and sort of fight, flight, freeze mode. It, it uh, causes sort of a, uh, you know, influx of activity in our amygdala. And as long as the amygdala is sort of actively sort of swarmed and swamped by those sorts of emotions, uh, what's inhibited in our brain? Yeah, logic, our executive function, right, gets inhibited. The creativity is, uh, you know, is sort of inaccessible uh, when our brains are swamped in that way. So if it makes sense for us in a workplace that we, in a psychologically unsafe, that that hinders our, uh, um, our function, our ability to be creative and to problem solve and to, to innovate, uh, then it makes sense that individuals who are in crisis who also have our same human brains, experience the same thing. So we want to make sure that we are uh, paying attention uh, to, the, to the sense of psychological safety that we are helping to create for the person in crisis. It becomes a very essential uh, part of this work. So what is happening here in California? I think you all know by now that California is introducing a new community-based mobile crisis intervention service, regardless of insurance coverage. This expands the array of crisis services in California. It does not take anything away. It doesn't take away your ability to, to bill for other things that you're able to bill for, but it adds a new Medicaid treatment benefit for children and adults. Um, and that's very exciting news. Um, and this new service is an alternative and intended as a first response in lieu of more restrictive first response options, such as calling law enforcement or even sending a co-response team or, and by co-response there, I mean law enforcement and clinician, uh, and it's less restrictive than sending somebody to the emergency department. It doesn't mean that that those other approaches won't ever get used. It's just that with the introduction of this new service, more often the first response to somebody's home or school uh, or other community-based setting will be, um, will be a, a team of trained uh, crisis uh, workers. This is specifically a treatment service. It's a brief treatment service. So it is uh, focused on delivering relieving stabilizing interventions that sufficiently resolve the crisis in place in the community with a lot of emphasis on personal choice. And in doing so, California is creating a safer crisis care experience. So what is that safer crisis care experience? It in, and when, I, when I'm talking about a safer crisis care experience, I'm talking about that from the shoes of the person in crisis and their family members that they experience it as a safer approach for them. Um, so what does that include? It includes offering responses that come early, earlier in a crisis, not, in ha not having to wait till things get 
highly acute before I request the service, offering responses that are voluntary, uh, that they're local, uh, and that they are community-based. And then in addition, um, it involves using approaches that are purposefully collaborative, they're resolution focused, and they result in diminished use of law enforcement 5150 and 5585 evaluations and inpatient hospitalization. And notice the word diminished, right? This is not about barring the door to any of those options, but it is that if we lead with this safer, earlier voluntary approach that is treatment focused, as a result, there will be diminished need for these more uh, intensive restrictive um, options here. There, you know, this is obviously a big state of California and there um, is a lot of variation in the way crisis, is pra crisis services are delivered currently. Um, and, and so I know there is a lot of innovation. Uh, many of you have done variations of crisis work, including mobile work for, for decades. Um, nonetheless, for other, other parts of the state um, and in ways that probably vary for all of you, this new service um, uh, is a significant shift in practice. Um, so, you know, first, this service is provided in the community, um, included in homes and in schools. It's not a service that can be delivered in an emergency department, for example. That's not an allowable location. Um, it does involve engaging individuals that are not known to the team and being, you know, the team that goes out and is the first one to, to knock on that door. It does mean responding to acute situations. And in doing so, we're still wanting to, to um, maximize the use of voluntary innovations and minimize the use of less restrictive solutions. So given all of that, it's also important that the work is experienced as safe for the teams in the field. The goal here is not to shift uh, risk to the teams. We want this to be mutually safe for the individual and family that we're going to see and for the team that's going to do the work. So how do we do that? Uh, some of the ways that, that teams have, have Im improved this sense of, of safer crisis care for teams um, is through the use of technology and logistical efficiencies uh, that make it easier to communicate back with the sort of the telephone team, uh, make it easy to dial for assistance, um, give good uh, information on, um, on location and how to, to drive somewhere. When, when I was managing mobile crisis teams, um, you know, some of my biggest concerns were, you know, people getting to the scene, knowing how to get there, knowing what door to knock on, those sorts of elements. Um, and the logistical efficiencies that, that include things like, um, you know, the ability to electronically transfer information and safety plans to the team so they've got some history and they've got some knowledge before they're, um, you know, knocking on a door, for example. Seamless interface between the mobile team and the call center, really sort of having a good trusting relationship about those initial conversations that are happening when somebody requests a crisis service. Um, the, uh, the knowledge that, that that call center team themselves has the skills to, to provide a, a relieving, calming, engaging phone call so that by the time the team gets to the home, a person has already had a chance to sort of catch their breath and get some relief. Um, so that's always useful. And then that ability to, to call back and forth with a team, with a, with a center, uh, with a, the phone team, for example, uh, to see if there are extra resources needed or those kinds of things. Continuous consideration of safety for everybody, including psychological safety, is, is quite important. As teams, we want to be sort of continuously aware of how people are experiencing the work. We give people permission to end a service when they want to end it. Uh, we give people permission to take a break. All of those things matter. Diversifying the team is another way to in, improve the, the uh, care experience and make it safer for everybody. And there are some, um, oh, I guess I'm going to get to that in a second. So before I get to that, um, 
How else do teams experience the sense of safer uh, care? Uh, it includes through the use of approaches that promote rapid establishment of trust, that calm crises and maximize choice. Some of you have no doubt been involved in restraint reduction initiatives uh, on inpatient units or residential treatment centers. And, and you know, if you think about the elements that make those restraint reduction initiatives work, it's not simply by only admitting people that are not likely to need a restraint. It's not by um, putting staff in danger uh, as, as people are doing dangerous things on the unit. It is fundamentally by changing the approaches that the, that the team takes on the, on the unit. And so there's a kind of a, an analogy here to how we make things safer in the community as well. It's using those same kind of approaches um, so that we are just really going in and a person feels safe with us as soon as possible. Another strategy is to engage other systems and stakeholders so that the upstream of the crisis and the downstream of the crisis practices shift. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you get your phone call that somebody wants mobile crisis work, but before you get that call, other systems and players have done things and they can do things that help or they can do things that make it worse. So for example, if the school says to the child, if you don't behave yourself, I'm calling that mobile crisis team and they are gonna take you to the hospital, that's probably gonna escalate the situation, right? If that school administrator though says, hey, you know what? We know a team of people and they've worked with other kids who have felt the same way. And we'd like to have them come out to have a conversation with you about how you're feeling. That's a very different kind of an experience. So we want all of the upstream folks to do a good job taking approaches that are initially calming um, and then letting people know what to expect when, uh, when the mobile crisis team comes. The other aspect of that, the upstream part, is working with colleagues to request a different kind of service. So instead of calling to request a 5150 evaluation, for example, they can have a broader menu of things to request. And our first goal is, hey, can, can we get a, um, you know, a mobile crisis team to come have a, a first go at trying to stabilize this crisis in the community instead. We want to kind of push that decision to go down the 5150 route or to go down the law enforcement route. We want to push those things sort of downstream as much as possible uh, and try these less restrictive things first. Downstream of the crisis, uh, we want to pay attention as well because the effectiveness of our intervention here depends on the readiness of the rest of the system to do those next steps um, as it relates to somebody getting quick access to services, somebody getting quick access to other sort of whole health needs that, that might be lacking in terms of kind of food, clothing, shelter, uh, all of those medical care, all of those aspects that, um, that can really complicate a crisis for individuals. And then the last is to really adopt a learning community mentality. Um, this, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, recovering perfectionist. And um, I would say that one of, you know, one of the hardest parts about doing this kind of work is admitting the imperfection of it. Uh, it really will never be perfect. And so staying in that learning community mentality makes a lot of sense. Uh, knowing that we can always do better. It is kind of continuous improvement that never really ends uh, as we learn more and do better and learn more and do better. Um, those things also help to make this a safer crisis care experience. So I mentioned before the di diversification of the mobile crisis team. And if you've had a chance, and I'm sure you have by now to, to read the, the bin that describes this service, um, there, the trained individuals that can can be part of this mobile uh, mobile crisis response team are actually quite diverse, and so it is a way to really uh, bring a bidisciplinary approach uh, into the response. Uh, so that includes uh, peer support specialists and and family peer support specialists who bring lived lived experience and that unique set of 
uh, peer competencies uh, to this work. Community health workers uh, who are trusted leaders, who are cultural brokers, who know their you know, specific regions, communities, cultures, and can uh, you know, bring that sort of knowledge and skill onto the team. Another option is to use EMT, paramedics, community paramedics, who of course bring their medical expertise and the ability to consider some medical comorbidities that might be a part of the crisis that's happening right now. So the ability to really, you know, do the vitals and just kind of check overall health status and see if that's a factor, answer questions, um, hear about medications, you know, all of those kind of uh, skills that they bring. So if co-response with some other discipline, uh, peers, community health workers, paramedics, uh, if that's new to you or your team, if, if you're used to sending a clinical team or if you're used to going out solo um, as a sole clinician who's doing um, this intervention, it can feel disruptive at first. Uh, and that disruption is a good thing. Uh, and why is that? You know, I head back into chat. What is it about, um, about diversifying a team? It's disruptive and what? And it brings different perspectives. It brings different perspectives. It brings a, a shocking perspective. I, I, I just had not even thought of it that way. Um, so it just expands, and, and in doing so, it also expands my knowledge. Um, I'm a social worker by trade, and so I, you know, I'm sort of of that mindset. Uh, but if I go out with a peer specialist, now there's a whole other discipline here that I can be uh, paying attention to, and I'm watching how the peer specialist works, and I'm watching what's effective, uh, and I'm thinking about approaches that they're taking that are just would not have would not have sort of struck me. And now I learn some some new sort of tips here. Uh, and it changes even how I do work down the line. Uh, and yes, Bethany, absolutely. Uh, it's also their support for each other in going out as a team. What this new service is not is a mobile cry is a is a screening model, right? So let me say that again. This mobile crisis service, this new one, this new Medicaid service is not a screening model. And all across the country, the most common sort of historic model of mobile crisis response has been narrowly focused on assessment, screening for some kind of level of care, often hospitalization. So it is not limited to that kind of a service. The historic models are less often the first response to the crisis. Um, I have worked in states that, uh, you know, the vast majority of mobile crisis work is happening in emergencies departments, for example. That's not a first responder. That's sometimes the third responder. It may be that law enforcement saw somebody in the community did their evaluation, took them to an emergency department that did their evaluation, and now mobile crisis has come in as the third responder. So that's not what the service is. We're looking for a first response uh, mobile crisis service. In this narrower model, the key deliverable is often determining eligibility for hospitalization and sometimes uh, determining the model for or determining whether involuntary criteria are met. Um, and, and in California, I know that's been part of, of the model here is uh, for some teams, probably every county's got this obligation to, to sort of sort out if somebody meets 5150 or 5585 criteria. Um, so often those have been sort of like the narrow focus of, of these kind of models. And because those are the key deliverables, the content of the intervention sort of gets narrowed down so that the smart team that understands sort of the primary reason they're out there um, kind of narrows into what's going to help resolve the situation as soon as possible, help move it forward as soon as possible. And that's often trying to get information about what the receiving facility is going to want to know to make an admission decision, 
You know, we know what that hospital is going to want. And so we're going to ask those questions and also what an insurance company is going to want to know to make a, a service authorization decision. So suddenly we're doing sort of a system focused intervention versus a person focused intervention. But it becomes narrow. And especially if I'm sort of moving from event to event, these become the key things to focus on. And all the other content is just sort of peripheral. It can get taken care of some other time. That is not sort of the urgency. When we're doing this kind of resolution-focused crisis response, we want to take away those artificial kind of barriers to the work that we're going to do here um, so that we really are paying attention to sort of the whole of the crisis as the person's experiencing it. And we are setting aside thoughts around what happens next. We're sort of putting that aside. So we really focus on here and now relief resolution. Let's see if this works first. And then if it doesn't, we'll collaborative, collaboratively figure out what to do next. Sometimes if the model is that screening model, it can even influence the actions of a call center team. Um, and the call center team um, will end up sort of narrowly authorizing or narrowly activating um, the mobile crisis team only if there's really a question about the need for hospitalization. I'm, I'm doing some work in another state right now, and I just read through some 30-ish plans of, uh, you know, of various crisis teams. And the, the language I kept seeing was, if they're at imminent risk of harm, then we'll consider sending the mobile crisis team only if we don't need to send the police instead, right? But it wasn't talking more broadly about, um, you know, people that are in distress, people that are in duress. And I can be in distress and duress and not be actively homicidal or suicidal, but can still be Im impairing my functioning quite a bit. Um, so we wanna make sure that these kind of habits that can happen of being sort of narrowly focused on level of care, 5150 eval, don't then translate back to the call center that ends up limiting who gets access to this service. And I know Danielle just uh, put the link into the bin. And so you can see in there, uh, you know, when you have a chance, sort of a broader definition of who's eligible for this kind of service. If in your county, um, most of the work has been around 5150 type evaluations versus doing this kind of treatment focused brief crisis stabilization service, it will be important to really kind of sit and think that through because the, the, the services have some dichotomous roles. And of course, the teams that go out to do 5150 evaluations do, I'm sure, uh, you know, pay attention to these some, some of these things and try to sort of calm and stabilize as much as they can. But that's not really what that service was ever about. That wasn't really what that was uh, getting purchased for. So you will have to really sort out within the county um, these dichotomous attentions, the, uh, the dichotomous roles, and and recognize that for people that have been doing um, sort of the 5150 evaluation for a long time, the muscle memory leans towards that. And you know this, this is all an indicator of our smart human brains at work. If I understand my key role is to determine whether these legal criteria are met and whether the insurance company and the hospital will have all they need, then my brain turns on to that sometimes before I even leave the office. Right, I've gotten the call and already in my brain, I'm thinking very likely to meet criteria, or I might even be thinking, I'm not even sure why they're sending me because it doesn't look like there's any chance they'll meet criteria. So already in our head, our smart, our smart brain is trying to move us forward efficiently. If that's what's happening, it's hard to sort of undo all of that and say, I wanna push that stuff way downstream. My goal is to go out and really engage the person and see if we can sort of stabilize here and now. One of the things I'll often say to teams that find themselves stuck in that thinking is um, imagine for a minute that there were no psychiatric hospitals, none, and you're it. How can you make a difference, right? What would we do in the absence of 
inpatient psychiatric hospitals or any kind of bed-based support after our intervention. And that's the skill that we want to be really building out. How can we be in, of service here and now um, to stay, help to stabilize this crisis? So consider how to delineate those two functions, both in team practice. Sometimes that means two, two different teams, um, one that is sort of like the first line team that goes out and, and maybe you've got a sort of a different 5150 team. Um, but also how to delineate this for other system players. There are, you know, if, if you happen to be in a county where the mobile response is really limited currently to that 5150 eval, then there are no more likely, most likely there are some people that call to actually ask for that. I'm calling for you to come do a 5150, right? And so we want other system players to understand that there's a broader menu of options available now with this new service and to be able to talk about those options with us and to request that kind of service in lieu of jumping right to the 5150. We also want to delineate this for crisis service users. Sometimes, and again, I'll just encourage you to have you know, some local conversation here with service users. Um, sometimes uh, the term mobile crisis feels equivalent to 5150 eval, for the individual in crisis or their family members. Um, and so there's a connotation that way. And, and if that's the case, that can perhaps uh, cause some hesitancy to use the crisis service. So that's gonna be another thing to unpack locally. And that might be with your local Mental Health America group or NAMI or other um, setting so that you can really introduce this as an alternate service intended to be community stabilizing, intended to be voluntary, um, so that this really becomes uh, clear that there is a there's really a new option in town. So it is a markedly different service from that 5150, 5585 evaluation. For some individuals and teams, this will be very different approach to care. Uh, and of course, it will be new to those who have been through the 5150 process historically. So it's quite a complex change. Um, and for our colleagues that are accustomed to that historic practice of really being in sort of the designated or designated evaluator role, it also can feel risky to ask for something that's less intensive and less coercive. Um, so this is a developmental transformation process that's gonna unfold over the course of many months and, and less intensely for a couple of years. And that's if it is purposefully managed. Like you have to actually have these tough provocative sensitive conversations in order to get to the change. There are uh, four competencies that I have discovered over uh, my years of doing this sort of training that are really essential to promoting safer crisis care. And they're not gonna be look like rocket science to you here at all. Uh, the first is delivering interventions that are person and family centered, the second is delivering crisis interventions that are strength-based. And the third is delivering res uh, interventions that are resolution-focused. And I have a fourth, but I'll leave that one for a second here. Um, again, nothing you know, earth-shattering about this set of competencies, um, although they are all harder to do in practice than they look in writing. And these are words that we sort of overuse. Um, uh, we say them all, not necessarily understanding them all deeply. And, and I think these are uh, all three competencies that require sort of a lifelong learning approach. These competencies are essential to really all of the best EBPs, right? Solution-focused therapies and motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapies and DBT all require that individuals that are providing this work have these, um, these skills, what seems to happen in crisis situations is that the skills don't always seem applicable and that it feels like in a crisis situation, we should revert and take over for 
the individual in crisis and maybe even for the family member versus practicing these interventions in the course of even an acute crisis. And we can really use these well into a crisis situation, even in acute situations. Um, but we can take this much further than we than we than you might think that that we can. Uh, the fourth competency is the ability to deliver crisis services within the context of a broad, interconnected crisis of care, uh, crisis system of care. And there are other models out there. Uh, this is mine. Uh, it doesn't matter what model you use, um, but think systems. Uh, and think county systems, and there's certainly a statewide sort of arc there as well. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this later, but this kind of mobile crisis response work is necessarily systemic. It's necessarily systemic. It can't be done in a in sort of a, of a limited uh, silo. But before we get to those competencies, there are two overarching themes. Um, that states and communities and teams invariably grapple with during this kind of system, uh, crisis system transformation. And so I think it's really important to reach new understanding, uh, you know, as an agency, as an agency board, uh, within a team, uh, within sort of that county construct, um, before you really sort of launch into this kind of new service delivery. Because if, if these two things don't get resolved, then it's going to really impact the, the kind of effectiveness uh, you want to have as a, as a team. The first big theme is around managing risk. Everybody who does mobile crisis response and all the agencies that employ people that do mobile crisis response, think about risk. We are working with individuals whose healthcare crises are often life-threatening. And so that is a big responsibility. It is very natural to be concerned about personal risk, personal liability, corporate risk and corporate liability. Those are all natural things to be concerned with. But it's also important to have a broad understanding of the ways that crises increase risk for individuals, that we think about this in a whole health way and not a narrow kind of mental health, behavioral health lens. And then this last bullet is really critical because in addition to those other risks, we have to be very aware that the way the system responds to a crisis can also put people at risk. And this third one is the one we really want to be amplifying and, and, and locally to be amplifying this aspect of it. It helps to, it helps to really solidify our thinking on this crisis system transformation. When we lead with a focus on our liability, and when we lead with the focus about making things safer for us as the responding agency or team, we can miss and misunderstand important information, and we can end up making things worse for the person in crisis. When we proceed in our care without understanding how the person is experiencing our care, we can make things worse. We can misunderstand the things we're seeing in front of us when we don't understand that we're the one that's kind of creating the reaction. When we do those kinds of things, we're putting the person in crisis at risk of iatrogenic harm. Iatrogenic harm. And are you familiar with this term? Uh, go go into chat for a minute and just make a note or a thumbs up, thumbs down if you're familiar with this term, iatrogenic harm. I'm seeing a, a mix of some yeses and some nos. If you if this is new to you and you leave with nothing else, I hope you leave with a good understanding of, of iatrogenic harm today. Of course, it's a medical term, so it's complicated, hard to remember how to say it, hard to remember how to spell it, uh, but it's worth committing this to memory. Iatrogenic harm is harm that is caused by treatment. It is generally unintended. 
but it's also often avoidable. It's hard to avoid until we are clear that the harm is occurring. Iatrogenesis means brought forth by a healer. And here's the real kicker. Any intervention, regardless of a provider intention, introduces a risk of harm that would not otherwise be present. So I, I'm, I told you I'm a recovering perfectionist. I'm also a recovering expert. Uh, and back when I was an expert, I really thought that my interventions would have one of two impacts for the person I was working with. I either thought it would be really helpful or it would be neutral. But what did not cross my mind was that it could be harmful. Now that's a really big blind spot to have. My good intentions do not translate into helpful intervention. And sometimes my good intentions translate into harmful intervention. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about some uh, kind of common examples of iatrogenic harm in the medical field. But while I'm doing that in chat, could you please put in some, now that you've read this definition, put in some examples of iatrogenic harm in the behavioral health field. So in the medical field, there's a lot more conversation about iatrogenic harm that's happening. For whatever reason in our field, no matter what state I've been through to in the country, there are a whole lot of people that have never heard the term iatrogenic harm. Uh, and so it's a, it's a really important one to bring forward here. But here's some, here are some kind of typical um, examples in the medical field. I go into the hospital to get my tonsils taken out. And while I'm there, I acquire MRSA. It wasn't uh, intended, uh, but could have been avoided. Um, or I uh, am supposed to have surgery on my left knee and oops, they accidentally um, operate on my right knee. Uh, that one's also uh, problematic. Um, so those are just a, a, a few different examples on, on the medical side of things. Uh, Shannon puts an example on the behavioral health side, uh, addictions caused by psychiatric prescriptions, is certainly iatrogenic and unintended and avoidable. Um, mm, Jacob, good one. The system overreacting for fear of liability and detaining an individual on a 5150 when they're asking for help and willing to safety plan and, I, and engage in, in lower level of care. Mm. Nice. Maggie, re-traumatizing a client by reviewing historical trauma for assessment purposes. Wow, that is so good, Maggie. Uh, why are we doing it? Who's it benefiting? What's it for, right? We open that can of worms and what, right? Really good example. We'll keep, we'll keep uh, kind of talking about this here for a couple more slides. But here's a little bit more about iatrogenic harm. When there is iatrogenic harm, it implicates us as providers of the service, and it implicates the systems in which we operate. So here's the interesting thing about iatrogenic harm. It's never about the person we're working with. It's always an implication of us. So iatrogenic harm is specifically that harm that comes from from treatment. The good news about that is that it gives us power. We're the ones in the driver's seat to find ways to reduce risk of harm. Uh, it does require continuous improvement of craft policies, procedures, and it is easiest to recognize when we orient ourselves to the care experience of the person in crisis and their family, and when we view it from their shoes. And you know that's that is important in all of medicine that we really sort of understand it from the the shoes of the person, but even more so for us because we don't have those same physical manifestations. Um, you know, if the surgical team operates on the right knee, the wrong knee, eventually they're going to sort that out. Everyone's going to see the patient and the doctor that oops, we really made a mistake here. There's this physical manifestation of the harm. Um, the, uh, uh, the addiction that Shannon referenced is a physical manifestation of the harm. And so it's a little bit clearer. It's less clear to see the iatrogenic impact of a 5150. 
right? Because it's, it has, uh, it's not, it's not sort of that physical manifestation. We have to really inquire about that care experience to understand that. Um, we may recognize that, that, uh, uh, reviewing uh, trauma history is uh, seems to be agitating a person in the moment, but maybe we don't. We might miss that because we don't really see that uh, medical or that kind of physical manifestation. One way to, to know that we're making a difference here is to really pay attention to coercive practices. And, uh, and as, um, as Jacob said, to really pay attention to system overreaction in using things like a 5150. So we can diminish the need for those coercive practices and just make go with the assumption that coercive practices have an iatrogenic impact. Does that mean we never use them? No, but we sure want to acknowledge that there is iatrogenic impact and do everything we can to sort of mitigate that. And as you sort of look around your community, um, look for things that are experienced as coercive, but sometimes have more to do with imminent risk. And, and, and I'm just going to sort of make a note here that um, that that word coercive as applies to as it applies to the work we do doesn't feel very good. Um, it's not sort of who we sort of think of our ourselves as, but we're, I'm really talking about sort of power control, taking over decision for forced, you know, all of those things are in fact coercive to the person that's experiencing those. Uh, so I'm not saying they can all be avoided. Uh, sometimes they have to happen, but we just really want to have our eyes open that it has an impact and do everything we can to mitigate it. Uh, so although there can be a guise of safety, uh, sometimes um, those habits have less to do with imminent risk and more to do with things like habits that, that develop over time. Convenience. Convenience, for example, an inpatient hospital that says, well, we really prefer it if everyone comes over on a 5150. It's just easier for us because we don't have a doctor here. And so if they change their mind, we won't be able to kind of do that evaluation, right? That's, a, that's sort of a convenience thing. Uh, cost. Sometimes there are actual incentives for a community to do an involuntary admission versus a voluntary admission. Uh, could be related to transportation, concern about personal or corporate liability. So operating in a trauma-informed fashion requires the system to really re-examine these practices and mitigate these harms. And the hardest one here are the habits. What are we in the habit of doing? Sort of, this is how we do it here. And you know, as a as a uh, ex uh, clinical director at a crisis agency myself, it was very useful as I started traveling the country and looking at other systems. It made it easier to go, wow, we we had developed some habits here that um, that were iatrogenic. And uh, as I see how other teams are doing it, I can see that there there could have been ways to do that better. It's not just us. Uh, this is uh, from uh, SAMHSA. Uh, talking in general about, uh, you know, public institutions that are intending to provide services and supports and how any of these public systems can be trauma-inducing. Um, obviously, the use of coercive practices, seclusions, restraints in our field, uh, the abrupt removal of a child from an abusing family and child welfare system, invasive procedures in the medical systems, disciplinary practices in schools, intimidating practices in the criminal justice systems, all of these things are traumatizing. They make things either physically and or psychologically unsafe. And these practices and policies often interfere with achieving the desired outcomes in these systems, thus the pervasive harmful impact of traumatic events on individuals, families, and communities, and the unintended but similarly wet, widespread re-traumatizing of individuals uh, make it necessary to rethink doing our business as usual. That is really the kind of the crux of the conversation today. How do we rethink doing business as usual? So we can watch and look for um, these kind of coercive practices across the broad crisis services spectrum. Uh, even though you're not doing work as mobile crisis teams in some of these other sort of parts of the system, you're... That those practices do impact your work with the individual in crisis. 
Um, so we can uh, avoid routine use of law enforcement uh, in, in any aspect of the crisis episode, uh, pay attention to whether facilities have a preference for an involuntary hold or admission, um, pay attention to restrictions that are really by rule instead of by exception, um, carrot stick systems that are a lot about sort of behavioral management versus really crisis treatment. Um, Unscheduled, if you see sort of patterns of unscheduled or against medical advice discharges, they might be an indicator that people are experiencing care as coercive. Uh, if you see high frequency referrals to child protective services, uh, ask more about that. Um, routine use of security guards, restraints, uh, seclusion, and also as you're reading language, um, of, from services that have delivered in, in other places, you can actually just look at that language. Uh, and what's the language telling us about sort of the intention of the action and, and sort of the belief of the person who wrote it? Okay, so that was theme one. Theme two is about storytelling. And this is a big one. And I'll, I'll give you sort of a quick sort of scenario here. Uh, way back when I was working in the state of Massachusetts and had flown in uh, on a Sunday night as I had been doing uh, weekly for quite a while. Um, and got to the rental car company. And instead of my usual rental car, which was, you know, like a Honda Civic or something, what was waiting for me was this big, beautiful muscle car. And it was lovely. And I'd never driven anything quite like it. And, uh, and I thought, wow, I, what would everyone think if I got, if I pulled up in this big red muscle car? Uh, but I also knew I had a lot of traveling to do that week. And I decided I'm going to do this. So I got into my fancy car and I drove to a downtown hotel that I had stayed at many a time and, you know, late in the evening, pulled up in front of the hotel and the valet uh, came around to open the door. And he's somebody I knew because I'd stayed at this hotel, you know, many, many times. And so he opens up the door and he cracks up laughing. And I said, what is so funny? And he said, and just excuse my bad, bad uh, Boston accent, but he said, I saw the car coming around the corner and I said to myself, who does that guy think he is having a midlife crisis, thinking he looks so cool in that muscle car? And then I opened the door and it's you. I was the last person he expected to see in the car. So we had a good laugh about that, uh, that he had sort of so quickly judged, uh, you know, the driver of this car. So the next morning I wake up and I call valet and I say, I'm ready for my car. And they say, oh, Cappy, we've got some terrible news. Uh, your car got a flat tire in the garage overnight and your fancy muscle car there has one of those little donut replacement tires. And so you're going to have to take it back to Hertz and get something new. And I kid you not, they gave me that. The white minivan. And there's not a valet in anywhere in the country that would find it funny if I pulled up in a, in a white minivan, uh, which tells another story, right? The white minivan is for the soccer mom, right? never been a soccer mom, uh, but nonetheless, what is it that's happening here? Our smart brains tell stories. We are naturally, as human beings, storytellers. It is part of who we are. It is in our DNA. The crisis systems and habits of practice are built on the foundations of the stories we tell. Our deep beliefs influence the way we build these programs. So what does it mean that we don't tell many hero stories in our field? So what are some of the deeply held beliefs and stories that are impeding our effectiveness as teams? Sorry, my forward isn't working. So what are some of the historic stories of individuals with behavioral health conditions? What do we tell of the frequent flyer, for example? What kind of historic deficit stories do you hear out there? Stories about the parents of children in crisis. Stories about how we think individuals use the system or use treatment. We even tell stories about our own services and our own role in effectiveness. Uh, and all of those stories influence what we do. Hmm. Unconscious bias. Yes.
Here's the thing about the stories we tell. The stories we tell predispose the actions that we take. Our brains are our number one tool in this work, and they can be trained to aid us. But we have to be very vigilant to any deficit stories that we tell and then actively work to change them. And some people saw a version of this if you were on the, the kids training with me last week. Uh, for example, we can work with our brain to tell and believe this story. A person in crisis is never a barrier. A person in crisis is never a barrier. And have any of you ever met a person in crisis who appeared to be a barrier to their own recovery? Just put a quick note in chat. If you have ever met a person that seemed to be a barrier to their own recovery, why would it make sense for a treatment team to adopt the belief that a person in crisis is never a barrier? Why would it make sense to, to work from that belief that a person in crisis is never a barrier? Mm. Because if we think they cannot recover, then we're working from that lens. So if I deeply believe that a person cannot recover from their illness, it will predispose the approaches that I take. A lot of system of issues are systemic in nature. Their symptoms are creating the barriers. Yes, the sy symptoms are creating the barriers, not the person. Interesting thought. And some of you might have seen this diagram uh, last week as I was talking about uh, responding to kids in crisis and, and engaging their parents. Uh, and once again, we'll look at this as it relates to understanding how the stories that we tell predispose the actions that we take. So in this kind of simple diagram of the brain, uh, we're going to focus on these three parts of the brain and, and, and just to kind of remind us all how information moves and through our brain and how our brain reacts to it. So the spinal cord is, you know, this very primitive part of the brain. And this is the place where information enters the brain, what we smell, taste, touch, uh, hear, um, all of those things enter through the spinal cord and they come in in very narrative fashion. Um, so the story enters through the brain. Um, and it doesn't even necessarily come in uh, kind of as fact, right? Because our, sometimes our narrative is influenced by interpretation. So this is where the story enters the brain in narrative fashion, sometimes, sometimes sensory fashion. And the first thing to um, respond then is our limbic system. And the limbic system is trying to determine, is this safe or unsafe? The limbic system is a very protective part of our system. It's where fight, flight, freeze lives. It is, uh, it is uh, sort of our first line of defense. And so the limbic system responds first. And then if it is safe, now our executive function gets engaged. So what happens when I pull up in front of the valet uh, and he says to me, I saw the car coming down the street and I said to myself, who's that guy think he is? thinking he looks so cool, having a midlife crisis. That was the instant story that entered into his spinal cord. And he had a limbic system reaction to that, feeling derision, dislike, joking about, kind of making fun of, right? That was kind of the automatic limbic system reaction he had to the story he told. And he was probably all prepared to kind of act accordingly, maybe laughing under his breath when he opened the door until he saw it was me and his whole narrative that had formed kind of popped away. So what happens to us in this field where we don't tend to tell many hero stories, right? So here's, here's a story you might have heard once or twice. Um, we're getting called to go see the frequent flyer who never cooperates. If a treatment team, if a mobile team deeply believed, and obviously a pejorative term to call somebody frequent flyer, 
still a term that is often used in this field. So if the treatment team deeply believes they're going to see a frequent flyer who never cooperates, if that's the story that enters the brain here in the spinal cord, then what kind of limbic system response might that team have? Imagine being the, the mobile team that's assigned to go see the frequent flyer that never cooperates. What sort of feelings, thoughts and feelings sort of quickly arise when you get that assignment? Head into chat and make some notes here. Negative, I feel resentment. What else? Eye roll, yes. What else? I'm annoyed. What else? How, how, how motivated am I feeling? How um, optimistic am I? I'm feeling under-resourced. I feel challenged. What else? What kind of emotions? Oh, this is a waste of time and a waste of my resources. I'm making decisions before I even see the client. I feel helpless and hopeless. What else? So let's just, you know, kind of keep thinking of that good job, sort of imagining this situation. So if a treatment team knocks on the door and they are feeling annoyed, negative, resentful, they're doing the eye roll, they're feeling under-resourced, challenged, believing it's a waste of time and a waste of resources. We're making a decision even before we get there. We're feeling hopeless, helpless, right? Then how is that team predisposed to act when they get there? What are we predisposed to do with this deep belief about the situation and how hopeless this is and what a waste of time it is? What are we pre predisposed to do when we get there? Avoid, mm. judge, yeah, what else? Rush, blame the client. And I'll misinterpret or miss their needs. We might be in fight, flight, freeze mode. We're gonna do the same thing we did the last time. Mm. We might blame the system, yeah. And it's, it's it's very important to give ourselves a break here and understand, again, this is our smart break at brain at work. Um, you know, if we believe, and somebody made a comment about this earlier, that a person is unchangeable, unfixable, right? It, it just feels hopeless to us. And so this is our smart brain saying, you've got an impossible situation here. It's really a waste of time. We should be doing something else instead. And then automatically it's influencing what we do. So now let's take this a little step further and take off your treatment hat for a minute and, and set it aside and stand in the shoes of the person that you uh, have just gone out to see. From their shoes and, and kind of talking in first person or typing in first person, how do you experience it when the mobile team comes to your home and they are avoiding? and they are judging, and they're rushing, and they're blaming you, and they're misinterpreting you, and they're missing your needs, and they are clearly in fight, flight, freeze mode, and they're just doing the same thing they did last time, and they're blaming the system. From the person standing in the shoes of the person in crisis, how are you experiencing that? Uh, I feel marginalized. I feel like I'm not being cared about. I'm not being given the services I need to get the help I want. I feel like there's no point in asking for help. I feel like I'm a burden and I feel like they're afraid of me. I feel worthless. I feel judged. I feel like giving up. So recognizing that these kind of deficit stories are so prevalent in our field we are awash in them. We can purposefully change the way our brain works, right? I can deeply believe a person is never a barrier to their own recovery, for example. I can purposefully adopt a strength-based story and employ that instead and sort of trick my brain by letting a different story enter my spinal cord. And this is a story that sort of formed for me over the years. And before I got to this sort of mantra, 
um, I did sort of the long math that you have to do sometimes to really rethink uh, sort of the narrative that we have formed about a person, but this is what works for me. I insert, insert the story into my spinal cord that I'm about to go see a person who is credible, capable, intuitive, and able to collaborate. Regardless of the story that came in, regardless of what's written on paper, regardless of what the previous record says, I prime my brain to engage a person that's credible, capable, intuitive, and able to collaborate. Now, if the mobile team is going out to a home and they deeply believe they're about to see a person who is credible, capable, intuitive, and able to collaborate, if that's the story that enters the spinal cord, how does that feel when you're standing in the shoes of the team that's going to respond? How are you feeling? What are you thinking about going to see the person that's credible, capable, intuitive, and able to collaborate? Go back into chat. What are, you, what are you feeling when you get assigned to go see a person that's credible, capable, intuitive, and able to collaborate it? Danny says, I'm feeling open-minded. I'm feeling positive. I'm feeling hopeful, Priscilla says. What else? I deeply believe I'm going to see a person that is. I feel valuable, I feel effective, I feel motivated, I feel willing, I feel great. And when I'm feeling those things and I, I feel excited, I knock on the door and I'm feeling that way. Um, what am I predisposed to do when I get there, when I am feeling open-minded, positive, hopeful, when I'm feeling valuable, effective, when I'm feeling motivated and willing, when I'm feeling excited? How am I predisposed to act when I'm going to see a credible, capable, intuitive person and I'm feeling this way? I am predisposed to, as Bethany says, listen and explore. I am predisposed to partner. I am predisposed to understand and support. I am ready to use all my skills. What else am I predisposed to do when I'm feeling that way? And let's just, uh, again, take our hat off and put it aside and stand in the shoes of the person in crisis. How do you experience it when the team comes to you feeling open-minded and positive? When they come in hopeful? When they come in effective? When they come in motivated and willing? When they come in excited? When they come in listening and exploring? When they come in partnering? when they come in supporting and understanding, when they are clearly using all their skills, uh, when they come in receptive. Yeah, so I'm feeling like, um, I'm not even sure where the change was. So Jennifer might've been saying, yeah, when the team comes in that way, I feel receptive. Uh, when the team comes in, my anxieties are lower. I feel relief. I feel trusting. And because you feel trusting, relief, anxieties are lower, you're feeling receptive, what becomes possible? Change, collaboration. What are you willing to do as the person in crisis when you are trusting this, when you can feel the collaboration? Ah, I'm ready to engage. I'm more open to treatment options. I'm more willing to be in a partnership. And what has happened to you when the team comes in this way in terms of your crisis state? What happens to your crisis state when the team comes in in this strength-based way? It de-escalates. And you know, even in this kind of superficial way of standing in the shoes, can you feel that it has a relaxing impact? And what's happening is, right, the limbic system is getting relief. And the rational part of the brain is getting activated. 
when we do not have this, when the limbic system can let down its guard, right, then, then we can really um, begin to sort of partner and relax and settle in. And so this becomes now uh, a safer psychological experience, psychologically safer experience. And does it become a safer experience overall for team and person in crisis, right? We come in in a psychologically calm state. They feel the de-escalation. Now we're both working up here with our rational brains and we've created an overall safer situation for everybody and a more productive situation for, um, for resolution. I'm gonna take us back to iatrogenic harm for a minute. Um, so we talked before um, about uh, uh, iatrogenic harm uh, being uh, harm that comes from treatment and wanting to think about how do we minimize iatrogenic harm. And I'm gonna just talk for a few minutes about the experience of inpatient hospitalization um, and, and use this quadrant model to sort of talk about that. And the, the reason I'm gonna talk about, obviously inpatient hospitalization is a really important part of a crisis system of care. Um, and, and they can produce great results for a lot of people. Uh, so it's a very important part of, of that work, of, of the work in our communities. At the same time, um, it is not all things to all people. And uh, when mobile crisis teams or crisis systems in general are, are sort of stuck in this binary of do they or do they not meet the criteria for hospitalization, uh, and when that hospital is sort of the, the place that's sort of held up for consideration every time, it gets a little bit cumbersome. And so I just wanna sort of tease this out a little bit. Within a lot of communities, there are deeply held beliefs and a lot of stories about inpatient hospitalization, it, psychiatric specifically. It has been around for a very long time. Um, inpatient psychiatric hospitalization preceded kind of modern day, you know, uh, community mental health services by, you know, some hundred plus years. And with that, comes a lot of deep beliefs. That's not necessarily deep beliefs of the mobile crisis team, but it can be sort of the system at large. It could be the person who's referring somebody to you for mobile crisis services. But some of those deep beliefs might include things like, it's the best and highest quality service. And so if it's the best and highest quality service and my loved one doesn't get it, it can feel like I got lesser care for my loved one. Um, it can be viewed as the safer place. Uh, there's a sense that inpatient treatment is something you do to a person, and somebody might say he needs inpatient treatment, but of course we need to be more specific than that. Exactly what kind of treatment do they need, and does this hospital actually deliver that kind of treatment that they need? There can be the sense that fabulous tests are going to uncover the answer and excellent medications are going to sort of treat the symptoms. There can be a belief that sending somebody to the emergency department and them subsequently getting admitted is the best risk management harm reduction strategy. And that because somebody's a dis discharged from inpatient treatment, it should be an indicator that they're stable now and can return to business as usual, and that there's always good linkage at the end of those stays. So you may have heard one or more of these kind of themes and stories. They can lead to sort of this belief set about hospitalization as 100% good and effective um, and, and can sort of just drive us towards that um, solution when people meet the criteria uh, without sort of slowing down and taking a more um, person-centered and balanced uh, look um, at this. So we're gonna do a little bit of practice-based evidence here. There's, there's really not much evidence-based practice. There's not much evidence-based science, evidence-based for the efficacy of inpatient hospitalization, right? There's, there's actually more that's sort of branching up in the literature in the last few years, but in general, um, it's not a service that comes with like this, uh, you know, X percent effectiveness rate sort of label. Uh, so in the absence of that, I wanna do a little bit of practice-based evidence. And I'm going to do that um, using this quadrant model, which is a way of looking at two intersecting points. And so I've got two questions for you. And, and the first is, based on your experience in this field, 
uh, and people that you know that have been in and out of hospitalization. Based on all that, all of that experience, what percent of time would you say individuals have experienced a good health benefit from hospitalization? So in this quadrant model, I'm looking at this vertical arrow set here. So as a percentage point, and don't overthink this, um, what percent of time would you say people experience a good health benefit from hospitalization? So put that number in chat. Is it? Okay. All right, numbers are going in. Let's get a few more in there so I can get a nice average. I'm calculating them in my brain as we go. Numbers are coming in really consistently. That's going to make this easy to do. Okay. So it's looking like on average, and we've got some variability as high as 30%, as low as 15%. I'm gonna just put that at about 25% based on the average. So this group kind of based on their evidence-based practice says about 25% of the time people are getting a, a good health benefit, which means that 75% of the time they're not, right? And, and are there factors that weigh in on whether somebody gets a good or not good health benefit. Like what are the variables? There might even be some things you know before somebody gets hospitalized in terms of how optimistic you are about the health benefit. So what are some of those variables that influence how effective the benefit is? Ah, the hospital staff, the, the level of genuine care and attention, uh, the census, who else is in there? You know, this is a this, this one kind of type of medical care that happens in a congregate setting. So the rest of the, uh, the team, it matters as well. Uh, the empathy uh, from hospital staff, uh, the amount of coordination between psychiatrist and client, um, uh, lack of availability of beds. How about for the person themselves? Think diagnostically. Uh, you know, are there times that um, you know we're more optimistic or not optimistic? Um, what other things kind of factor in to the health benefit? And the acuity of clients. How about for the person themselves? What's things? Their the level of engagement or motivation. Mm -hmm. How much does past experience play in? Does, does it matter if the admission was voluntary or involuntary? Mm. Uh, so Maggie's saying trauma. So I'm, I'm gonna make a guess, Maggie, I might be wrong, uh, that if there's a trauma history, trauma diagnosis, that that might impact the effectiveness of the hospitalization. Let's see if that might be part of it. Yep, she says yes, yes. So, uh, so somebody who has PTSD, uh, perhaps somebody that has autism uh, spectrum disorder, they may have lesser benefit. We want to make sure that there's specialization on the unit for the actual diagnosis that I have. Uh, previous experience on a unit. Uh, and what if it's a an involuntary admission? Do you think that has an impact on likelihood of a good health outcome? Oh, gosh. In the client's eyes, if it confirms uh, what others are thinking about them, that they're crazy. The recovery model would indicate that somebody who's voluntary would likely have better outcomes. Uh, yeah, so it has an impact because there's less trust of the care provider. If we think about that previous brain diagram, right? If somebody goes into the hospital with their amygdala swamped and swarmed about this unit and if it's safe and that they didn't want to be there voluntarily and all of those kinds of things, it makes it harder for them to settle in, right? So are there contributing factors such as substance use, lack of community family supports? There are lots of factors that weigh in here. Some of them can be mitigated, um, but notice that we're not anywhere close to 100% efficacy. And all of the places that I have um, done um, this exercise, 
um, you know, 25% is probably about the average that I get everywhere else. Sometimes it's as high as 40, sometimes it's as low as 15, but nowhere does it get up to 100%. So we collectively, our, our practice-based evidence is that it's not effective 100% of the time. So let me now ask you about this other um, factor here. And this is the horizontal bar, and this is the iatrogenic risk. So based on all the individuals that you know that have had psychiatric hospitalization, what percent of time do you think people experience iatrogenic harm from hospitalization? It's an interesting phrase that Maggie put in their note that hospitals prefer people come in on a hold. So often voluntary patients are kicked out quickly. Mm, we got some, we got some work to do, huh? Okay, so uh, what percent of time do people experience iatrogenic risk? I see a 75, a 60. Mm, Bethany says, I think it's higher than we'd like to admit. 50% uh, of the time. Okay, I'll just average those three numbers because that works out pretty well to maybe about 62% of the time, something like that with my quick math. So 62% of the time, this group says people experience iatrogenic harm, which means about 38% of the time, that's not a particularly big factor. Um, but we see here with this quadrant model that, you know, we're really looking at these two things in a kind of an interactive way, best case scenario is we admit a person to the hospital when we're optimistic about a high health benefit and we're not terribly concerned about iatro iatrogenic risk. And the worst case scenario, right, is we admit somebody who doesn't get a good health benefit and the, the risk of iatrogenic harm is high. Um, and then we've got sort of these yellow boxes that are a mix here. Now, this is not a decision tree. It's just a way to expand our thinking um, so that as we're building crisis systems, we're, we're really paying attention to who's likely to be in this red box and how can we do things differently, right? And how do we get everybody closer to the low end on iatrogenic harm and closer to the high end on you know, efficacy of inpatient treatment and in terms of getting a good health benefit? It's just very good sort of food for thought. We can apply this same quadrant model thinking to really any service benefit that we use. Critical to us, recognize that any treatment introduces the risk of harm that would not otherwise be present. So we can't refer anyone to any service and call it a 100% risk-free service. All of those services introduce the risk of harm. I can do outpatient treatment that makes things worse for me instead of better, right? We in our work can take approaches that are iatrogenic or that are relieving and calming. So here's the historic question about, um, about uh, hospitalization. And, and this is often the one that mobile crisis teams are focused on. Does the individual meet criteria for hospitalization? Again, that's what the insurance company wants to know. It's what the receiving hospital wants to know. And it's an important question. Do they meet the criteria? But here are the questions that are asked less often. What is the expected health benefit for this individual? And what are the risks of iatrogenic harm for this individual? And given that, are there any alternatives that can offer this person equal or better potential health benefit while decreasing the risk? This is a really consequential consideration. And I'm gonna use a medical uh, analogy here. And I'll say medical analogies are very helpful. Uh, in sort of a rethink of crisis systems. So imagine that you have a, uh, a bad knee and you have been waiting for your insurance company to authorize uh, knee replacement surgery for a very long time. So you get a call from your doctor and the doctor says, good news, the insurance company has approved uh, the, um, the knee replacement surgery, yippee. But then the doctor goes on to say, by the way, I wanna let you know that knee surgery is, is effective 25% of the time. 
And it causes iatrogenic harm 62% of the time. And here are some alternatives that could be considered. Would this change your thoughts about knee replacement surgery? And my guess is that as I asked the questions, you were considering it in terms of your life and your knee and your balance of risks and benefits. And that with, you know, 60 of us on this call, there would be 60 sort of different ways of, of moving forward here. So your thoughts about how to proceed might really vary. Individuals get treatment recommendations from a lot of sources. And you might hear, you need to get this service. You need outpatient. You need partial. Your child needs inpatient treatment. And too often as a field, we minimize, we emphasize the treatment benefit, but we skip or minimize the discussion of the iatrogenic risk. So we can broaden those conversations uh, with families, individuals in crisis and their families in a shared decision-making fashion. Um, to really explore more deeply. Sometimes the phone call comes in and says, I need to be in the hospital immediately, or my child needs to be hospitalized immediately. Uh, and it's a great chance for us to really sort of come in and say, tell me more. What are the good reasons to pursue that? Are there good reasons, even given all those good reasons, are there any good reasons to avoid it? Uh, what concerns you most about hospitalization. How do you think you or your child would experience that kind of service? We're broadening the conversation to raise awareness of the potential for benefit and the potential for harm and doing what we can to sort of mitigate and consider alternatives. How optimistic are you about the potential health benefit? How concerned are you about any harms? What could lessen the risk of harms? What can improve the health outcome? Are there alternatives to consider? What would help you in making this decision? Interesting um, opportunity in mobile crisis work to do watchful waiting, to be able to not decide today, but to give it a couple of hours or a day or two to really figure out what to pursue in terms of treatment. Okay. All right. I'm gonna now kind of take us back to these four core competencies that I've talked about. And I'm just gonna be doing sort of a high level um, skim of these uh, concepts. So the first uh, essential competency in this kind of mobile crisis work is doing person or family-centered care. And I'm gonna use this analogy of the true north of person or family-centered care. And this builds off some thinking of Don Berwick, um, who is really, a, you know, world world renowned uh, physician and sort of architect of, of a lot of of how a lot of healthcare systems work. He was actively involved in the Affordable Care Act and aspects of that that were not as well known nationally. That really had to do with things like um, developing more collaborative care models. Uh, hospitals taking new and innovative approaches to reducing um, some iatrogenic impacts like hospital-borne pathogens and, and some of those things. Um, but what Don Berwick said is, if you're going to transform healthcare in America, then the experience of consumers and families and communities must serve as true north in that transformation. You can't take a group of doctors and put them into a room and have the doctors themselves build the healthcare system. We have to hear from people who are using those services. Joyce Berland of national NAMI fame takes that further by saying, this means that the ordinal point for system quality has to be derived from the recipient's reality. This is our lived experience. These are our needs and our beliefs and our strengths and our reactions to services that are extended on our behalf. Who do you want to judge the effectiveness of your knee replacement surgery? Does it matter what the doctor says about it or does it matter how you experienced it? The doctor might say, ah, it's the best knee replacement surgery I've ever done. And you might be thinking, 
but I really can't walk and I'm in a lot of pain and I don't have a whole lot of range of motion, right? So what really matters is your experience. It is your knee. And so we want to make sure that we're really aligning our care to the experience of the person. Person and family-centered care is an instead of rather than in addition to service. And it's instead of an expert-driven care. It's a shift in how we orient ourselves to the work as the team that's doing that work. Use of a compass kind of helps us understand that substantial difference in orientation. So in a, um, in a uh, kind of an expert orientation, which is really still the most common uh, model of care, which is a medical model, it's sort of the doctor knows best, the doctor comes in, the doctor evaluates, the doctor decides, the doctor recommends. Um, the, the, the smartness is all kind of coming from the brain of the doctor. Um, so here we have the, the person or the family that's getting the service, who they are, where they are, their culture, their beliefs, their worldview. But the intervener is coming in from their own headspace, my worldview my sense of what needs to happen. So it's sort of 180 degrees difference. It's not aligned with the person. It's sort of aligned with my uh, skills that I'm bringing to this uh, work, and my, but through my lens. When I am doing person-centered care, I actually have to reorient myself so that I'm delivering my care in alignment with the lens that the person in crisis and their family is using. It's a very different orientation. So I want to see how they see it so that I can start with them where they are. I don't have to agree with where they see it, but I want to see it and start there. So for example, if, if a person says, I need to be in the hospital today, and I don't have any reason to think that they need to be in the hospital, I don't, I don't come at it and say, uh, no, you don't. You don't meet criteria. I come up here and I join with where they are. Say more. Tell me more about that. What thoughts have you been having? What are the good reasons to go to the hospital? I join there. And if you're that person and I join there, you can probably feel being heard, right? And then you can elaborate further. Tell me more. What are the good reasons? What's led you to think that? And it's not because hospitalization is going to be the outcome. It's, this is kind of our starting point. And as we talk and as a person develops kind of their narrative here further, we can ask some of those other questions about sort of alternatives, any harms, any past experiences, and, and, um, and begin to introduce other, other sort of ways of solving this problem that, that perhaps don't involve hospitalization. Um, Person-centered is not order fulfillment, for fulfillment. Just because a person says, I want to be in the hospital today, doesn't mean we have to come in and do it. This is not McDonald's, right? It's a starting point for a conversation. It gets really complicated. Sometimes there are other entities involved as well. So we have the person in crisis and maybe their school administrator. And so as a team, I might find that I first have to be able to join with the teacher so that we can both, or administrator, so we can both collectively do a kind of a person-centered lens here uh, with the uh, with the person in crisis. Um, so that's kind of one way of thinking about it, that I, Cappy, have to step, step up out of my own shoes and come up here and see it the way they do it. It's not natural. Most naturally, I look at it through my Cappy lens. And I want to be able to see it through their lens, their culture, their experience, their preferences, priorities. When I do that, there's a change in the power dynamic. And this arrow kind of, this kind of different graphic here gives a sense of that change. So most care is sort of that traditional medical model, uh, expert-driven model, where really the, the team of providers sort of holds their point of view, their expertise, and sort of high regard. It, it can diminish the uh, sort of the knowledge and information that the person brings. Um, and so there's high power um, for uh, the team in this expert-driven model. And the person in crisis really has minimal power. You think about that when you layer on um, the legal process uh, that is a 5150 and 5585. Um, that adds a, even an additional amount of power to the 
uh, the mobile team with really minimal power for uh, the person uh, in crisis. When we're doing person and family-centered care, we get an equalization of that power and a sense that both people bring vital information to this. Both people have smart ideas about what should happen next and that this is a very kind of collaborative power sharing sort of uh, place. When we get to person or family driven care, now the power differential has shifted so that the person in crisis really is the one with most of the power and folks that have really achieved sort of a level of recovery that have a very, very clear sense of what works and what they need um, can, can uh, uh, be really empowered in this kind of a model to really guide their own uh, kind of supported recovery. So we want to play with all of these sort of concepts of power. This is tricky. Again, when we're concerned about liability, it can feel very scary to feel like I'm giving up power. But person-centeredness does not uh, is not sort of a, a power giveaway. It's a power share. We're just really allowing them to sort of join in here. And in this collaborative model, there's actually quite a bit of power uh, in landing at a disposition that really feels like a consensus disposition. Um, we end up a place where the person in crisis feels comfortable, we feel comfortable as a team. Um, and, and when there's sort of a shared consensus decision about what happens next, um, there's a lot of power there. I do not, when I shift to that person-centered mode, I'm not giving up my expertise, I'm giving up my expert stance, right? I'm giving up that expert lens. It takes a lot of expertise to be person-centered. It takes a lot of expertise to hold this belief of, gosh, this person surely doesn't need hospitalization, but still be willing to join and say, hey, credible, capable, intuitive person, tell me more. What, what are you thinking about hospitalization? Right? And now that a person feels heard, listened to, and understood, they can articulate that better. And maybe they'll say, well, that's what my doctor told me I needed. That's what my PCP told me I needed. We don't know what'll come next, but because we've joined, because they feel heard, listened to, and understood, they'll come up to this higher kind of cognitive level and we can work that out and introduce some other options. So this is a shift away from that treatment provider lens. Um, and for me as a treatment provider, the challenge is I'm aligning differently um, with people in different circumstances, right? And even during the course of a crisis episode, where a person is will shift. Heightened crisis state, I want to join there. Calmer, activated, empowered state, I want to join there. Things will sort of shift all along, but I'm just sort of moving with the person as they move and they get relief and, and experience some recovery. Some notes about aligning with True North. Uh, perfection is not possible. Um, the true north for an individual is continuously shifting. And we are, when we do this, we are sort of you know, providing services in the dark. I'm not really standing in their shoes, um, but I'm doing the best I can to sort of join them where they are. This is a strength-based approach, but some word to the, a word to the wise here. Uh, strengths are not always pretty. Instead, of doing thinking about strength-based intervention. And I, I'll say back when, when I first heard about doing the strength-based work at the first time, back when I was an expert and I mostly focused on doc documenting pathology and thinking about things through a pathology lens, um, I had a hard time when the state of Ohio where I was practicing um, started emphasizing gathering strengths. And I was like, you know, how is how does it matter if they're good at basketball and basket weaving and you know, handwriting or art or whatever, how does that really matter here, right? We're here to focus on this pathology. So what I will say to you is when you expand your definition, in case you get stuck the way I got stuck on this, if you expand the way you think about strength, and if you even look at the dictionary definitions of strength, you see they go well beyond assets and talents. And, in, and instead, they really talk about strong, dominant kinds of words. And so if we think strong-based interventions, it's easier for us to, to join in that way 100% of the time. I need to be in the hospital today. Tell me more. 
right? That's a join, even though it's strong. I'm deeply angry. Tell me more. This doesn't feel safe to me. Let's make it safer. So I'm going to look for what's dominant and join there. So where is their concentrated focus, intensity, strong emotion? Where is their resistance and avoidance? How do I join there? Some of these strong responses will actually turn us off. And they might seem like signs of pathology. And they might even be evidence for a higher level of care. Like I start documenting these as part of the mental status exam. Resistant, manipulative, avoidant, poor judgment, no insight, lacks insight into illness, lacks insight into need for higher level of care, right? I can get turned off by it, revert to expert mode, and start interpreting what I'm seeing as signs of more illness. When in fact, what might be happening is I'm seeing the iatrogenic impact of the approach I'm taking, right? Like I might actually be the one that's producing these kind of reactions, not signs of the mental illness, but signs of a normal, natural fight, flight, freeze re response to the approach that I'm taking. So what do I do when I find myself coming up against something I, I dislike in that way? It's strong and it's turning me off. I step out of my expert interpretation about what I'm seeing and I reorient to the lens of the person that I'm engaging. I remind myself, this is a credible, capable, intuitive person who's able to collaborate. That gets me in the headspace. And this credible, capable, intuitive person is refusing. This credible, capable, intuitive person is insisting. This credible, capable, intuitive person is angry or suspicious. Now, how am I predisposed to respond when I add that little element? What do I do when I deeply believe that a credible, capable, intuitive person is refusing, insisting, angry, suspicious? manipulative. I get curious. Tell me more. What's happening? What am I misunderstanding? What part of this do I not get? It takes some practice to play that out when you start to sort of play, if, if you, and, and I'm sure many of you have versions of this that you already use, but if, if taking that kind of strength-based approach, credible, you know, competent, capable, capable, incredible piece, if that's new to you, it can feel silly to do it at first, um, but there's not much harm in it because you're really doing it in your own head and that it just shifts that dynamic when you go to the field. So once you've started to see sort of examples of it working, then it becomes something that, that feels sort of safe and smart to do consistently. Okay, the next competency is achieving precision and making sure that the care that we're delivering is resolution focused. So person-centeredness is about alignment, and it's about taking that strong-based approach. So we're aligning even when it's a turnoff. I refuse, right? We're aligning even then. Resolution-focused means using approaches that are experienced as relieving and resolving. And we want to see evidence of that. Uh, symptom reduction, empowerment, health activation, meaning I'm starting to get motivated, interesting, interested, taking steps towards. Uh, when a person experiences clarity, when there's a real diminished risk, like a person says, I'm feeling better. Those thoughts have diminished. I'm not feeling that way anymore. This is clearer to me now. Uh, diminished angst, increased hope. We want to see that evidence. Even in the little, when I asked you to sort of stand in the shoes of the person in crisis, and, and we use that strength-based approach. And you said, I'm feeling more trusting. I'm feeling better. The crisis is relieved, right? All of that is, is sort of evidence that we're using an approach that is person-centered and resolution-focused. We want to document these things. We can sort of see that shift to higher level function. We can see them sort of changing the way they talk and their tone and the, 
the amount of language that they use and the emotion and they may sort of change and, and do some different kind of an activity or get up and get a glass of water or something that's sort of an indicator that we've seen a shift. We want to document these things. This is a great risk management strategy. Document what we see as evidence of or voiced evidence of relief and resolution of the crisis. Resolution focused programs believe in their efficacy in providing what for some people will be an end service. Not everybody, some people certainly will need a higher level of care. Some people will get some crisis relief and get a higher level of care, but they'll be clear about why they wanna do it. And they'll go in in less of a crisis space and more of an open-minded space for receiving that next intensive inpatient service. Chris Karski, an, an executive director of a, of a crisis agency says, we aren't providing crisis care, we're handing off crisis care. And then they hand it off and they hand it off and they hand it off. And he was talking about the hot potato approach to this kind of work, right? We don't wanna be the one holding the ball. But he was also talking about this emphasis on assessment rather than meaningful intervention. We have to have the actual intention to go do resolution focused work. It's very different than saying, I'm going to go screen and refer, right? Resolution focused is a whole different mindset. So my provider intention really matters here. Is it my goal to assess or is it my goal to relieve, treat? Is it my goal to sort of get this done and get this person on their way, disposition? Or is my goal that they feel better? is my goal that here in the moment, they get some relief and resolution. And a medical analogy makes this clear why this is so important for us. Let's say you found yourself with a badly mangled foot and you go to the emergency department. And the doctor comes into the room and does an assessment, pokes and prods, twists it around, does a couple of x-rays. How's your foot feel? How's your pain level? Is the crisis resolved for you? Assessment isn't, by and large, a relieving thing. Yes, it can be helpful to know what's wrong with your leg. Gives you some information that can be helpful, but it's not the same as treatment, right? We wanna make sure we're not just assessing, but we're also giving treatment. Somebody mentioned earlier in a chat, an iatrogenic risk of exploring trauma history. That's assessment. So not only is that not relieving to have somebody explore trauma history, it is actually worsening, right? It actually had an iatrogenic impact. We really, really wanna be careful that we are spending a good chunk of time doing relief, resolution-focused care. If I go to the dentist, because I have a sore tooth, and they does, they does the x-ray and says, yeah, you got, a, you got a big old cavity there. See you later. Not very satisfying, right? That's the assessment. What I want is the treatment. I want the actual relief. And so we want to approximate that too. Because if we're the person with the mangled foot, if we're the one with the cavity, what are we in it for? We're in it for the treatment. We're in it for the relief. So we can purposefully bring our intention to that work by going out with the intention to treat and not to merely assess. To envision an end goal of relief and resolution in the work we do, not merely disposition. It's not, when we wanna look at resolution from the shoes of the person in Christ, it's not us, right? Oh, it's resolved for me because they're in the hospital or they're not in the hospital. We wanna look at resolution for the person in crisis that we can actively work to really soothe the crisis state, restore executive function, and still know that relief and resolution can be incremental, right? The emergency department treatment of your leg, bracing it, stabilizing it, giving pain meds, that's incremental. There still might be more treatment down the road, but we can be doing uh, relieving work at this point of contact as well even if more relieving work can happen in the hospital afterwards, for example. It's important that we don't view treatment, relieving treatment as the next person's job. That's the they hand it off and they hand it off and they hand it off. And I've even heard hospital teams say, 
what we really do is a comprehensive assessment here. And then we make treatment recommendations to the outpatient program. That's not a California hospital, but I have heard more than one hospital team talk about our goal here is comprehensive assessment. Our intentions, again, predispose our actions. So if I intend to be treating and relieving, it's gonna predispose what I do. Every touch is an opportunity to engage, listen, affirm, and relieve. It starts with the first phone call to the call center, should feel some relief there. Then from every member of the responding team, I get more relief. And any more follow-up contact brings more relief. We give relieving intervention at, at every point of contact. What has happened? What are you experiencing now? What is the hardest part about this for you? All of these kind of questions are a chance for a person to voice what this care experience is like. I hear you. What would be most useful to you right now? What do you need? What is it you're trying to sort out? As we have these conversations, the essence of the crisis for a person becomes clear and important. The essence of a crisis is generally not the diagnosis. Often the essence of the crisis is one or more of these human experiences, fear, sadness, anger, exhaustion, hunger, lack. These are the kinds of things that swamp and swarm the amygdala when we're in crisis. And this is not a comprehensive list, but it's a decent list of a starter here. So I have schizophrenia, but the crisis state is the loneliness and isolation that I'm experiencing because I'm no longer working and I don't have my friends around anymore. Or it might be the grief I have at my career that was cut short, right? Uh, or it might be the lack because I lost the job and I don't have an income, right? Or it might be the uncertainty related to not having steady housing, right? The crisis state is not the schizophrenia. And we don't solve the crisis state by upping meds if the crisis state is boredom, isolation, exhaustion, fear in the community, right? We don't want to get so diagnostically fixated that everything we see, we see as a symptom of a diagnosis. Okay. Again, that was all sort of three sort of short reviews of those competencies. The fourth competency is now this crisis system of care model. There are other um, kind of example models out there. If you think about sort of public health models, some of you might be involved in sequential intercept models, which are aimed at, at helping, uh, you know, it's kind of the intersection between the mental health, behavioral health and the, and the criminal justice system, and sort of a systemic approach to really uh, interface at, at different points of that criminal justice system. Some of you might be familiar with children's systems of care models. Um, crisis services are necessarily systemic. Uh, and the management and treatment of mental health and substance use crises is complex, systems level, public health type uh, need, and it necessitates a commensurate response. This, if you if you have been doing in your county, if the if the mobile crisis response has been more limited to making sort of that 5150 determination, and maybe that involved you sort of going into an emergency department, making that determination and recommendation and leaving the need for this broader crisis system of care model may not be as clear. Uh, but if you have been doing more of the in-field um, resolution focused work, then it's probably clear to you how dependent you are on sort of this broader system uh, in order to get a good uh, result. If you look at something like an ACT team, an ACT team is very internally reliant. Like if we're a high fidelity ACT team, we can pretty insularly really help people stay safe in the community and, and really recover. Um, crisis teams are externally reliant. We're reliant on all of these decisions and actions from all of these other entities. So these challenges um, set crisis services apart from other types of behavioral health because there's really no single entity in a community and no single system that owns full responsibility for managing behavioral health crises. So for good crisis teams, uh, we have to have high external reliance on these other sort of partners and players in the community, whether they know it or not. 
Crisis systems do not naturally exist in a community. They do have to be built. In the absence of a built crisis system, it is going to be sort of reliance on things that are often present, like 911 and law enforcement and emergency departments and, and often jails. Uh, and although crisis systems can look uh, differently in different communities, um, they are there are some commonalities, um, as I've seen uh, models across the, the country. And the more you invest in each of the these models in the crisis system, um, the more likely you're going to have sort of the, the kind of depth and breadth that that allows for a really good functioning system. Um, and so that includes uh, invest, investing in sort of each of these five phases, kind of systemic investments in each of these five phases of crisis. Um, although this kind of follows the arc of a crisis episode for a person, we're really talking about investments. What, for example, as a county are we doing in terms of, of investing in crisis prevention? And what do we have in place in terms of early intervention options for a person in crisis? Is there a rapid way to get back in with my treatment provider, for example, if I'm seeing early signs of? And then the acute intervention phase, which includes mobile crisis work, crisis treatment, which includes community stabilization, inpatient hospital, crisis beds, any of those kinds of things. And then how well are we doing on that reintegration phase after a crisis episode? So we wanna pay attention to all five of those. Mobile crisis teams are, you know, especially with this new service definition, you have a chance now to really get in earlier before things get so acute. So you really fall here. So you, that's your kind of point of leverage. And of course, you can do crisis planning with somebody to prevent the next. But your point of leverage as a mobile crisis team is not here. And, it, and it's not here, right? We really are counting on the other entities to do that work. So we've got to work in sort of larger collaborative fashion. Um, you know, somebody put a note in, you know, well, hospitals have a preference to admit somebody involuntarily. Well, that's an impact. We've got a problem here at the crisis treatment phase. Right? And until that gets fixed, we're going to continue to have a challenge here of people experiencing sort of unnecessary involuntary iatrogenic care until as a system, we kind of get that resolved. In addition to these phase opportunities, these are five other sort of essential components here, starting with the importance of lived experience. Uh, involving people with lived experience in program development, oversight, and service delivery, right? You can't do it without us. We've got to be involved in this in order to have that work well. So lived experience is key. Um, having a strong set of players. Again, they may or may not know how essential they are as a player in the system, but that means over time, really developing good, strong collaborations with the schools and with the probation departments and, and with the um, uh, IDDD service providers and, and with those that are providing substance use services um, and with law enforcement and with courts, um, that we build the kind of logistics that make this work simpler, that make it easier for teams to move in and out, that make it easier for teams to um, uh, get the information they have. Um, and so we just have a good flow. Think of this as a giant countywide factory. How do we facilitate the movement of people and data? That we have good, strong competencies. I, 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 I'm just a couple of minutes, Daniel. That we have good, strong competencies across the field and not limited to just the crisis team. Uh, I know many of your communities are invested in CIT and that's a tremendous investment. It increases the competencies of law enforcement. Schools can do the same, right? So we get a broader set of people who are using these good trauma-informed approaches. And then the last thing is the parts. Adding mobile crisis service, that's a great new part. But that, just adding the part without paying attention to these other elements will not end up being a good, um, a good use of your investment. Okay, so in summary, here are some of the things that I've learned over my uh, decades of work in this crisis sphere, uh, and especially as I've been all around the country in the last 15 years. Uh, when we lead with worries about our own li liability, we will, we will get it wrong. We can and must reduce iatrogenic harm in the delivery of crisis intervention and treatment services. Iatrogenic harm implicates us, but it also gives us power. 
We are the ones in the driver's seat to make those kind of changes. I know that crisis systems are built on the foundations of the stories we tell, and we can tell different stories every time. Uh, and they will change the way we deliver work and it'll change the way people experience our work. When we engage individuals as credible, capable, intuitive, and able to collaborate, collaborate we are predisposed to use productive and relieving approaches. And we can deliver relieving interventions to everybody at every point of contact. You don't have to get there overnight, which is good because this is not the kind of change that happens overnight. It's big and it's complex. So think about sliding the bar. How do we get more and more comfortable with, right? How do we practice less restrictive? How do we practice getting more comfortable in the communities? Uh, gain clarity and consensus on, on sort of your risk thoughts of your current practice. Practice in employing these key competencies and taking them further into an intervention that you might be historically doing. And do this in settings that are as often as possible, natural, community-based, and local. And then actively to work to push the interventions that are experienced as more coercive further downstream. Hold the 5150 till further downstream. Let's see if we can take this voluntarily before doing that. Um, Again, with law enforcement, let's let's try to push their their introduction onto the scene downstream. Um, and even when we use coercive interventions, that doesn't mean we have to give up engaging people in person-centered, strength-based, and resolution-focused fashion. Most importantly, let those who use crisis services um, uh, serve as teacher and barometer of change. And thank you. I know I did go a little bit over. Uh, are we Thank taking you, a break Kathy. or not taking a break? Uh, yep. We are not taking a break. We're going to go ahead and jump right into the panel discussion. Um, thank you so much for all your insights and expertise and knowledge. That was amazing. And I really enjoyed seeing all the interaction in the chat from all the participants. So thank you so much. Um, we are going to jump right into our panel discussion. We have um, three folks with us today here to kind of speak to some of the things that Cappy presented today. Um, we have Sydney Barola, who is a family and youth partnership quarter, coordinator sorry, with Stanford Sierra Youth and Families and has worked as a mental health advocate for the last six years. She has navigated the mental health and kinship care systems and, util and utilizes lived experience to empower youth and elevate their voice and choice as they navigate services and mental health, foster care, juvenile system, and CSEC population. We also have with us Priscilla Ward, who is a licensed clinical social worker here in California, who is a skilled trainer and direct service provider. Her area of expertise include co-occurring disorders, substance use disorders, depression, anxiety, and trauma. Um, she has trained law enforcement personnel, so um, working with co-responder models, educators, and interns on the topics ranging from trauma-informed care, res trauma-responsive schools, harm reduction, mental health treatment, crisis intervention, um, and so on, and also um, managing the impact of vicarious trauma and second secondary traumatic stress. We also have Tom Orock, um, LMFT, from, um, who is the Chief of Community Engagement and Grants at the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. Tom and his team manage the implementation of the Commission's Mental Health Wellness Act grants, as well as um, the Mental Health Student Services Act and the psychos Early Psychosis Intervention Plus Program. Um, Tom is also a licensed clinician and has worked in the field for many years. And so I want to welcome all of our panelists today, and we are going to go ahead and move on to the questions. And so the first panelist question we have today are, what are your thoughts about this element of transfer transformation that Cappy spoke to in terms of mobile crisis response here in California? And feel free to unmute yourself and go for it. I can chime in. Um, so uh, it's really exciting to see this shift happening. Um, I think that um, most of us here have a uh, value of taking care of people and serving people, but there's a difference between serving people and serving people well. And I think changes like this are really highlighting the importance of serving people well and challenging us to um, make some really significant systemic shifts. Um, I know I, I use this in my work with um, clients and also when I'm doing training, but talking about our approach, um, sometimes being around waiting until the wheels fall off, and we don't need to wait until the wheels fall off. We don't need to wait until a person um, is in the worst shape possible before we intervene and um, implement some of the things that Cappy talked about um, with uh, being person-centered and 
and helping to resolve and relieve uh, what they're encountering. So it's exciting to see this the um, policy changes. Um, also, like understanding that um, the implementation is challenging, right? There's a lot of barriers. There's um, still systemic things that um, everybody in, in our organizations are going to have to deal with. And so it's going to take some time to see that trickle down. But overall, um, we're moving, I think, in a good direction. Thank you, Priscilla. Tom or Sydney, did you want to weigh in on that one? Yeah, I was just going to say I'm really happy to uh, the, the topic is great today. Thank you, Cappy. And um, I'm really just happy to see uh, all the energy and effort uh, going into this. Happy to see that there's more sustainable um, models coming through and that we have funding to support mobile crisis teams all over California. Um, it's going to be excellent. But um, this is uh, absolutely going to be needed, you know, more training for as many people as possible. I see, you know, I see the experts as the consumers of the services. So expert driven care is client or consumer driven because the, the consumers are the experts. Um, and I, I think that we can protect the system against holding on to practices that lead to uh, harm by insisting that uh, consumers are regularly consulted and asked to provide constant feedback about the services provided through satisfaction surveys. Um, not, not just once uh, as programs are being developed, but throughout the life of the crisis program. Um, so we need a much safer crisis care experience, uh, but we also need a more effective and helpful experience for the consumers and their families. So, you know, I really look forward to more, you know, measuring for safety, but also more measuring for effectiveness by asking the right questions as we collect data on the programs in the future. Thank you. I'll share a little. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, I'll share a little bit. Um, Priscilla had mentioned, um, and Tom had mentioned too, how like you want to look at like the broader picture and like the system of how we're providing services and, and people who are needing crisis support. And I think it's important also to really, for folks as you're going and working in these different systems and working to change these systems, to not get away from who you are as an individual and the power and balance that is naturally there from yourself being a service provider, because you have the opportunity to either make or break that person's experience solely based on your mood, solely based on how, what biases you're bringing into that space, how you're speaking to that person, um, how you're treating them. And that is a lot of the times, you know, what that individual will experience and what'll either keep them returning to receive support or just turn away from it completely. And then you're creating a whole bias amongst whether you're a social worker or someone in law enforcement that's coming in and providing a bad experience for someone, you're not providing and painting a terrible picture for that person in that entire profession of people based on that one experience. Um, so it's really important that while we can immediately change system issues, it takes years, it takes a long time to change system things, we can make an immediate change on ourselves and how we behave and how we present um, support to people. Great point. Thank you so much. That's that is extremely important to keep at the forefront, right? Is that systems do take time, but we can start more immediate, right? And we can we can make that transition as long as we're willing, you know, to go through the growing pains and continue to challenge ourselves to to do better, right? And to acknowledge that sometimes we do cause harm and there are ways to um, you know, combat that. And as as painful that as painful as that might be in the growth process, it it will ultimately be the best thing for everyone. All right, thank you. Next question. Do you have examples to offer of crisis care that was experienced as iatrogenic and care that was experienced as safe and helpful? I'm happy to uh, weigh in on this. Uh, um, both as a parent and as a therapist, I have, you know, and uh, in terms of my work at the commission, um, in um, administering grants for mobile crisis across the state. I've had a lot of experience in uh, personal and professional um, with this and the different types of care, whether, whether harmful or helpful. You know, um, about six months ago, I got a call from a mom of a 15 year old uh, yeah, young man in uh, Central Valley. He had been in the emergency room for 39 hours uh, when she called and asked for help. Um, and, you know, so 
I think just the idea of sitting sitting there in that setting uh, can be harmful and create more harm, even though it's a place where people are helped. I think when you sit there that long and you don't get the care you need, it starts to have reverse effects. Um, you know, and as a parent, um, many years ago, raising our son who had ADHD and a, a dyslexia and learning disabilities, um, I had I've had police officers in our home with our son uh, uh, when he was experiencing a mental health crisis. I can tell you that some officers were able to skillfully balance the job of keeping the public safe with the job of expressing care and empathy to our son going through it. Um, we've also uh, had the experience of being made to feel as if we were horrible parents and our son uh, was, was a bad kid. Um, you know, he's one of those students, uh, like I said, with, with disabilities that caused him to act out as opposed to act in. He really showed his frustration. When he was in, a, in a third grade, he was in handcuffs in the back of a police car. Uh, I, and, you know, and then in my work at the commission, I've been able to talk with several teams of clinicians with law enforcement officers and we really were able to uncover a lot of the philosophical differences that exist in mental health versus law enforcement. And, um, you know, I have seen great examples of, of, of law enforcement uh, officers who were just excellent with, with people and with our son and with us. Um, and I've seen uh, the opposite of that. I've also seen the same with mental health clinicians, to be honest, I, I've seen really uh, poor examples of care and empathy uh, from the mental health side. And so I, I really don't know if it makes much difference where you come from, but um, I think that's why the training is so critical that you know we're doing today and um, just to get everybody trained as much as possible so that we can make this a safer situation for everybody. I have a recent example of some iatrogenic harm um, as well. This is just a couple of months ago. Um, you know, I work with um, high crisis uh, clients. Um, so um, I had a client who was actively uh, suicidal. Um, he followed um, our plan, but still called me to let me know he was done. And I've worked with this client long enough to, to know the nuances and the way that he engages, he responds to things that he shares. And so we were in a pretty dicey situation. So my goal was, let me just try to keep him on the phone as long as possible while I'm uh, at the same time messaging his parents and saying, at this point, we need to call 911. We need somebody there right now. We don't have the um, ability to, to wait um, for a crisis response team. Um, and so coaching them through that while also doing this. And, um, you know, I've shared before that I'm fortunate that um, this was not our first rodeo with this family. And so they were very quick to activate um, and trust and understand what we needed to do. And I'm doing my best to keep um, this young man uh, safe as long as possible um, and talking to him through like, okay, let's join you with your parents. Um, this is what's happening um, and really leaning into the trust that we've determined uh, or we've established in our relationship um, only to have all of that crumble once um, responders made it on scene. And so um, there was a point where, you know, my call like ended um, and what I learned after the fact was that this young man followed every instruction that I had given him, every instruction that his parents had given him. And he was um, sitting on the porch of his house. Um, and the first thing that happened was that um, the fire department arrived, but they refused to come up the driveway to engage with him. Um, and there's like four or five police cars coming up the street. And the first thing that they do when they walk up, they ask no questions. They immediately put him in handcuffs and put him in the back seat of uh, a police car and then proceed to ask the parents um, for, a, for a tour of the home. And so the parents took that to understand that they, um, they were looking for some type of criminal offense. Um, and so they explained this is a mental health crisis. We were on the phone with this therapist. This is what's going on. Didn't matter. They came in and took the, the tour of the house. And the parents said, you know, we were hoping that if we were nice to the officers, they would be nice to our son. Um, so this young man sat in the back seat of a car for about 20 minutes. Um, and at this point he had, he was in a complete panic. Um, by the time an EMT took his blood pressure, it, it, he was a mess. Um, and they believed that he could possibly be having a heart attack. 
So they rushed him to the hospital. Now we're like in a medical crisis. And at no point um, did um, first responders communicate to the hospital that this was actually a mental health crisis. So uh, by the time the family made it to the hospital, uh, they were talking about stabilizing him and releasing him. And had it not been for the father saying, stop, this is a mental health crisis. Our son is suicidal. This is what's going on. Um, he would have he would have been sent back home without any type of um, intervention uh, or support, us knowing how severe um, he was in that moment. Um, but that resulted not just in in like literally like a medical crisis, which is I would consider that iatrogenic harm as a result of of what occurred that day. Um, but the fallout of that um, over the last several weeks has continued to be just this complete mistrust um, in um, the system. Uh, statements like, I will never call for help again. I will never like reach out to anybody again. I can't trust them. Like uh, it's terrifying. Um, and even, even um, you know, parents sharing a, a fear of, you know, had we not been there, like would they have done something to him? Could our son have potentially died or, you know, all of these other things. And so um, I think, I think that's that's one example of of uh, some gaps in the system that we have now. I also have a positive example because um, I don't want to just uh, uh, stay in, in the um, the harmful perspective. Um, but I uh, for a long time I managed uh, school based mental health programs, and I had uh, a student at a school who disclosed to an educator um, some suicidal ideation. Um, there was not availability from anybody on our team to come in and do an immediate response, but this was a high risk student, teen mom, who had uh, recently lost um, a baby to SIDS. Um, and so um, I was able to arrive on site at the same time as a mobile crisis responder arrived on site. And the way in which they engaged this young lady was beautiful. They were patient. They were kind. They took time to learn and understand about her situation. And rather than overreacting or over responding to the situation, recognize that she needed to be uh, linked to some intensive services in the community. And so we worked together to make sure that she uh, was linked to some in-home crisis support. Um, she got hooked up to uh, long-term mental health services. And that situation was able to stabilize, but she was also able to have some uh, long-term follow-up care that she was really needing as she was grieving. Thank you so much, um, Tom and Priscilla, for sharing your experiences, your own personal experiences as well, and um, just how you were able to provide very solid, clear examples of iatrogenic harm and, you know, and on different levels as well, right? Um, Priscilla, you mentioned, you know, officers responding, then first responders. Now, now we have a hospital setting and, and how that just went from one setting to the next and the level of harm just kept increasing. And, um, Although everyone was the intention was to help and support, we, you know, what was actually happening for the person in crisis was, you know, not being de-escalated. It was just further escalating him. Um, and Tom, thank you for sharing your own personal experience with your son. And um, I can't imagine how traumatizing that must have been for your third grader to be placed in handcuffs in the back of a police car, and what precedent that set for him for the future in his in his. Um, you know, relationship with officers, and that must have been really hard. So thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Uh, Cappy described crisis services as necessarily systemic, and that to get good results requires the development of a broader crisis system of care, inclusive of, wide, of a wide array of system partners with planning and investments, both upstream of a crisis episode and downstream of a crisis episode. In your experience, is it important to consider crisis services from this broader uh, systems lens? I'll share. Um, I would say yes. I'd say like those are the most important phases is when you're working upstream and downstream of when someone is experiencing a crisis. Um, and oftentimes, like at least from my personal experience, I've been on 50, like a handful of 5150 holds for various different traumas and um, grief and loss in my life um and each time when I was in the midst of my crisis I, I I didn't receive the best support it was only I was I was vocalizing before um the crisis would occur like this is what I'm needing this is what I need to see it's like okay I can get you a therapy appointment like a month from now or we can't do one-on-one -on -one therapy but we could throw you in group therapy you could do group therapy twice a week in the middle of your work day and that should be able to work and like I can't do that like that's not realistic and so like 
I, I wouldn't get the help that I needed. And then something very traumatic would happen in my life. And because I wasn't getting all of that extra support I needed on the back end, I couldn't help support myself. I wasn't able to build those natural support systems that should have been provided to me in the upstream phase of my life at that time. You know, like there, it's, it's very hard to, to, to get those things. And it's a privilege to be able to have certain natural support systems and to be able to have access to certain things. And when you're reaching out, they're so hard to find. And a lot of times you don't get the help until you have reached your bottom. And then when you're finally in the psych hospital and they're providing all of the different things that are available and that are supportive to you. And then there was a time I was admitted to the psych hospital and it was finally when I was there that I felt seen and that I felt heard. And that's all I'd wanted. That's all I'd wanted. I wanted to feel seen. I wanted to feel safe. I wanted to feel like I could talk about my trauma without someone looking at me like I was crazy, without saying, with someone telling me, you just need to be on medication when that wasn't like between me and that's between me and my psychiatrist. I'm not sure why a paramedic is telling me I need to be on meds. Like it's just not appropriate. And so it wasn't until I was in the psych hospital and I got lucky that I had a good experience in the psych hospital because that's not a lot of people's experience, but I did get very lucky in my experience that there was people that saw me and it, it allowed me to leave there and have a better idea of what I wanted for my life and what I was able to do and what I couldn't what I didn't have control of. And so when you have the right support system, you're able to help pick yourself up. And that's not the case for everybody, but who you meet throughout that process and who's there supporting you makes the world of difference. And yeah, even with the downstream process, I feel like for me, that also wasn't the greatest. I, you know, I had my psych hospital admission, admission. And then when I was released, then all of a sudden my therapist and my, um, service provider at the time was not let's do bi-weekly appointments let's meet you all the time <laughs> like I'm like okay where was all this help when I needed it before the crisis happened what's up with why are you all trying to call me all the time now and trying to schedule all of these things and trying to put me in programs that I don't need support in I was experiencing a grief at the time um, I had lost my two-year-old daughter and they're putting me in um, substance abuse um, counseling um, dual DDIOP was the program that they put me in. Um, and those are for individuals with um, substance abuse challenges and mental health diagnosis. And while I um, had an issue with substances at the time of my loss, my mental health diagnosis had nothing to do with what my trauma was, but they wanted to make sure they checked off a box and provided some sort of support to me. And so after just so many touches of different system, I was like, I need to step away from all of you because you're all just making my life so much more hectic than it needs to be. Um, and so those are very, very important to have your upstream and downstream supports, like very solidified, because like I luckily was able to get out of that very challenging and difficult time of my life. That's not everyone's case, um, but really ensuring that if you are in either one of those places or if, even if you're in the middle of the crisis support system, um, like realm <laughs> of support, um, that you're just being mindful of how you're saying things, what you're choosing to do and how you're choosing to support that person because it really just makes or breaks um, their life at that point. Thank you so much, Sydney, for sharing your own personal story. And um, I, you know, I really value just your vulnerability now and your ability to share your own experience and how, you know, that was all iatrogenic harm, right? Like that, that whole process for you from the start was just harmful and traumatizing and, and unnecessary. And I think that's what's Cappy speaking to, right? Is if the services had been there for you from the start because you weren't an immediate risk or an immediate risk to yourself or others, that that crisis service wasn't there because, you know, no one was saying or acknowledging that you might be an, needing a level of care evaluation, but you were still in crisis. Um, and it took you going through that process of escalation and needing that higher level of care for you to get the services and care you needed. So thank you so much for sharing and um, for sharing your story and for adding to that. Um, Tom, did you have something to say as well? Uh, well, yeah, just working at the state's mental health commission here, I, I, one of the things I've been uh, really happy to see and proud of is that we're kind of taking a a lifespan approach to the initiatives that the commission's involved with um, from uh, maternal mental health to focus on zero to five uh, trauma care for young little kiddos uh, to school-based mental health programs across the state um, to, you know, wellness centers and drop-in youth, youth centers uh, to now a program we just launched for older adults 
who are experiencing um, depression and who are at risk for crisis. So, I mean, I think within that, within the lifespan, there are so many opportunities to, to go further upstream. I mean, if I, if I have a peer respite program to go to, I know that there are people available who care about me and don't see me as the problem or an inconvenience. If I'm a student, I know that there's a wellness center on campus. Uh, I may, you know, when I'm feeling anxious or being teased or feel out of place, you know, that can really help to interrupt future crisis. Um, and the same with, you know, diff, you know, alternatives to emergency rooms, which is another program we're, we're launching. So um, I think there are ways to, to do that. And I, I can see that happening now. It would be great if we got to the point where we didn't need uh, mobile crisis services, but I, I'm, I'm sure we probably always will. But anything we can do to reduce it, you know, reduce hospitalization, reduce law enforcement uh, expenditures and involvement and increase the client experience, improve the client experience uh, would really be helpful. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Thank you for that. Okay, um, next question. Mobile crisis response will be available as a Medicaid treatment service for people of all ages for the first time. What kind of impact do you hope it will have for children's, uh, children, adults, and families? And I know you kind of spoke to this a little bit, Tom, um, but any additional insights or um, offerings you have? from either of you? I guess, you know, the first thing I'd like to talk about is my concern regarding mobile crisis as a covered treatment. I, I think it's gonna be great, but my concern is that it becomes, it, it could be become overly clinical and paperwork heavy. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this is a great way to sustain mobile crisis response with, with the funding that's available to make it a standard piece, you know, of our mental health system. Um, but if we're not focused, uh, focusing our attention on the consumer experience by collecting and analyzing data uh, on their experience, uh, we run the risk of slipping back into a pattern of response without empathy. Um, but um, I think it's been great to see over the last 10 years, you know, how California has grown uh, and now is going to grow further uh, to put mobile crisis systems together in, in every county across the state. Absolutely. 100%. Thank you, Tom. Go ahead, Sydney. Um, I really hope that with the birth of this new mobile crisis response unit that we recreate how the world sees, treats, and holds those struggling with mental health challenges and that we learn from our mistakes and that we're able to create sustainable change and don't fall back into bad habits as Tom was sharing. It's, it's really hard to unlearn a lot of damage. Um, and so I hope that with um, this new response system that's being birthed, that we're able to create a new, a new worldview for future generations and how they're able to view their own mental health and seek support for it, as well as those on the other end who are providing it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sydney. Priscilla? Yeah, I completely echo uh, what Sydney just shared. Um, I think um, access, like one is one huge hope that I have that this, like the access to adequate, appropriate, responsive care um, is something that, that we accomplish. Um, but um, ensuring that um, we continue to move away from hospitalization being the answer. And I think if this is done correctly, um, that you know scaffolded response before and then that step-down response after for those who do need hospitalization, I think there's a lot of hope here. Um, but yes, just continuing to move away from hospitalization is always the answer and making sure that we have um, like that whole continuum of care accessible to people. 100% agree with you. That That is the most important aspect of all of this, right? To continue to have everything accessible to all um, at all times. And um, we, we can't say that enough, right? Especially in the world of crisis services. So thank you for sharing. 
I want to thank each and um, each of you for being here today and sitting through the presentation and taking time to share your own personal stories and experiences. That really means a lot. And it also just adds value to what was presented here today um, by Cappy. And Cappy, thank you so much for all the wonderful um, knowledge and expertise you dropped on us today and your own experiences working in many multiple crisis systems of care. So thank you so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our Q&A. Um, part of the session. We have about 10 minutes left of today's session, so we want to make sure you all have some time to ask some questions. If we don't get to your question today, um, we will go ahead and respond via email. We will make sure that we um, note your question and get back to you at some point. Feel free to um, put a question in the chat. Um, you can unmute yourself as well, um, and we will try to answer all of the questions that we can. Um, any questions? I don't think there are any in the there is there is one. yeah um jacob asked a question about um how do you adapt this view to individuals who are malingering through making contingent suicidal homicidal statements uh, with the goal of manipulating the system into meeting their need and and uh, he started by saying how do you adapt this kind of an approach because it seems like it's an approach that works when it's a client that's genuinely needing help. But what do we do when they're not genuinely needing help? Needing help. Um, you know, I, I'm really glad you raised this question. And my guess is that as you wrote it, there were a whole lot of people that had had a person that they've worked with that maybe came to mind to them in their own work um, that also struck them as sort of malingering the system um, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so it can feel like that's not a time that we can employ some of these competencies. Um, there are really no limits to when you would use these approaches. It's sort of a 100% model as opposed to sort of figuring out who's really kind of eligible for, worthy of this kind of care. I had mentioned that before I came up with sort of that credible, capable, intuitive language that I was sometimes doing the hard math really having to think it through on a person-specific basis. And this is a great example of that. So this is going to sound maybe a little bit um, Pollyanna, um, but it's not intended as Pollyanna. And if, and if you kind of take some stepwise approach here, it can really make a difference. So it, in a situation like the general, the person that you described, my challenge to the team would be to start by really writing out what is the narrative that has formed about this person? What are our deep beliefs? What's the deficit story that's formed? That's kind of question number one. And then the second one, you can just do this in columns up on a whiteboard. The second one is how has that story over time predisposed us to act with them? What's kind of happened to our amygdala in other words and how does it predispose us to act? And then the third question is now take off your treatment hat and stand in that person's shoes. From those shoes, how do you experience it when the team comes out frustrated, you know, irritated, doing the same thing over again, angry, limit setting, whatever that might be? How are you experiencing it as the person in crisis? And then go a little bit further there, staying in that first person view of the person in crisis answer from that first person view, what does the team not understand? How are you experiencing this kind of care? What is the team missing, right? And as you really kind of explore that in first person way, now begin to make a list. What really is the essence of the crisis for this person? What's the essence of the crisis for the person that is uh, malingering and continuing to come back and taking advantage of the system, right? From their shoes, can we get to the essence of the crisis? We don't come across well when our, our limbic system is swamped and swarmed. And this person is not coming across well either with limbic system swamped and swarmed. So as we really began to sort of identify the essence of the crisis, unheard, unloved, and listened to, whatever those might things, things might be, you'll find a little rise of empathy. It's the kind of thing that makes it easier for us to come up here and see it the way they see it. And as that empathy starts to develop, as you get closer to legit being able to say, you know, some things that he's saying about his care experience are credible. 
and they're pretty intuitive. Uh, he's got some capability here of continuing to reach out for service even when his experience hasn't been that great. Now it really predisposes us to say, let's go out from that point of view. So now I bring up some my, my new list of sort of empathy. I'm about to go engage in as credible, capable, intuitive, able to collaborate, knowing that that story doesn't have to be 100% true, right? But what I've done by telling that story is I've changed my brain. And I have now access to the best of what I can be for a person, right? It lets me be my most empathic self. It lets me be my most patient, listening, viewing self. Sydney said, I was seen. They saw me. They heard me. And that's the experience we want to create for this person as well. Uh, and then we can uh, ask some of those questions too. Uh, even when he calls or when we go out, we can say, you know, it's dawned on me. We've been out here about five or six times, and it just makes me think that we're not understanding all of this. And so we can get curious about their experience as well. How have you experienced it when the team has come out? Uh, what have we not understood? What do you think the team has been missing in the past? What has been most helpful? Right. And now we're learning from him as well. So I don't know, uh, Jacob, if that sort of kind of uh, not just to Jacob, but for everybody, because again, I know you're speaking for everybody in the room who has found themselves in those kind of situations. So it's complicated. It feels silly at first. It feels like a silly exercise at first. It isn't. It is, it is one that really gets us in touch with uh, kind of a different way of orient ourselves, orienting ourselves to this work. I appreciate that. And, and you know, the the, the gaining empathy component, I, I really like and, and use that in my practice when I'm working with folks who are experiencing that, because at the end of the day, you know, the, the behavior that they're showing, you know, if someone comes up and says, you know, I, I want room seven in the psych hospital or I'm going to kill you and everyone else here, that yeah. that is because they have had, I mean, that has what been what's worked in the past, right? That's yeah. a skill because they can't tolerate their, their circumstances. I think the, the, Part that I find that it, I guess I found difficult applying kind of like mentally applying that model is working through the power differential and how you go from uh, provider centered care to client centered care, mm -hmm. because they are inherently in that situation using the power dynamic to manipulate you by evoking power struggle. So when you have a client that is is working their hardest to create a power struggle, give me what I want or else. Mm -hmm. it it seems difficult to apply that model to allowing them to then drive care because that's it's not necessarily accessible or functional and or or possible even um in a lot of those situations and so i think that's that's kind of turning it into like that that resolution based focus like how okay we have empathy how do we transition that empathy into working with this client beyond them just making Threats. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really good question, and it's easy to sort of jump to the most complex situation. So certainly try it on, try it sort of universally and see what happens, and you'll see that you'll get great benefit for many people. And then there are certainly circumstances that are tougher. But here's here's what I'll say about that. Imagine if this were, and again, I think these medical analogies help so much. Imagine that you are a cardiologist and somebody comes to you with the most complex cardiology condition that there is, right? And there's not sort of a clear path to doing it, right? The best I can, so, so there's two parts to this. One is they've come with this complex cardiac condition. There's no clear way to treat it. And I might say to myself, well, gee, my, I really am, you know, a specialist in doing, you know, heart bypass. So I think I'm going to try that approach. Well, that's something I'm comfortable with. We know that's not going to work, right? We can say to the person with this complex heart situation. Hey, if you could just meet me halfway here, right? And make it simpler for me to be to do my work. Well, we know that's not going to work. So the only option I have is to be as precise as I can be in my work. And how do I become as precise as I can be with my work? I sort out those biases. I sort out any possible thing that has me responding in a way that my limbic system is agitated. I sort out anything that makes me respond in a way that looks like I fundamentally dislike you, misbelieve you, uh, I'm going to resist you, I'm going to I'm going to push against. I that's the part that I have to sort out. 
And if I can sort that out and truly sort of stand next to that person in person-centered way and bring sort of my best game to this, they may or may not get better, but I will not have created more harm, if that makes sense, and sort of a simple way to say it. I'll I will not have sort of introduced that piece. And so that's part of our challenge. And, and, and this person may or may not respond to it, but we will not have created an iatrogenic impact. Because if that, if does that, does that sort of strike that? That, that, that does. I, I appreciate the sense that it's not always that you're going to find a treatment success, but so long as you don't cause harm, that may be the best outcome in that situation. That's right. And it's, and it at the end of the day is up to us in the field to get better at our work and to get more and more good, even at impacting with and helping individuals in that kind of complex situation, as you're describing, find some relief because that's a pretty miserable way to live. Absolutely. He's living, that person's living miserably. And so we see the empathy of, of that miserable, never satisfied sort of place. And so that's us continuing to hone our craft, just like the cardiologist is. It is imperfect work. It is imperfect work. And so we can't rest on our on our laurels in that regard. I so appreciate you bringing up that question. Thank, thank, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Cappy.